Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this podcast we are doing on really everything that I can try to cover and help people with related to lower back injuries in gymnastics, which if you look at the research is not as common as maybe ankle or knee injuries, which we've covered in the last two podcasts. However, if you look at the real world in the culture of gymnastics, uh, low back injuries and low back pain in general are, I believe, probably the most common issue that everyone in gymnastics deals with. So whether we're talking about women's artistic, men's artistic, rhythmic, uh, trampling and tumbling, um, adult gymnastics, aerobic gymnastics, team gym, many different departments of the uh, areas in gymnastics have people who really suffer from a lot of low back pain. And so like I said, I think that the injuries reported in the ankle or the knee joint are higher in the research because of, you know, uh, they're more obvious, you know, they're more uh, clear, you can see someone who sprains their ankle or unfortunately tears their ACL. I think with low back pain, um, it's underreported, and more people kind of suffer in silence and have back pain for a long time that maybe doesn't always make its way to a research study statistic or doesn't make its way to a reporting uh, avenue. So that said, with that in mind, just a quick uh, little overview, because I'm sure many people maybe are going to be hearing this for the first time from me, or from, you know, maybe uh, they, they haven't really seen the podcast, but they found this episode because they're, uh, they're having back pain, their son or daughter is having back pain, one of the gymnasts they coach is having back pain, they're a medical provider who is new to the world of treating gymnasts and they would like some help on lower back pain. So just to orient people, my name is Dave Tilly. I'm the CEO of Shift and I have many roles that I've played in my life. I was a college gymnast and I've been coaching since I was about 15. Um, I'm a physical therapist, a sports physical therapist and board certified in sports physical therapy. And I'm also a strength and conditioning coach and a researcher in gymnastics. I do a lot of consulting work inside the NCAA and elite uh, treating probably 30 to 40 gymnasts per week, or sorry, per month. That'd be crazy per week, uh, per month. Um, and I'm really uh, grateful and valuable, uh, have value that I, I, you know, am allowed to treat so many gymnasts and that they come to me for opportunities of, of uh, you know, injuries or consulting sports performance. And I think because I've had a lot of experience working with gymnasts over the last eight to 10 years, um, I, I think I can maybe see some trends or patterns or some things culturally that maybe have not quite made its way into the research textbooks. Although there's many great textbooks that are wonderful, uh, one that I'll be referencing quite a bit is one that we all worked on, uh, came out in 2020 called Gymnastics Medicine here. Uh, Emily Sweeney, a good friend of mine, is the editor, and uh, we worked very hard inside of that book to try to get a lot of people together to contribute, and so a lot of the research that we'll talk about today is inside this book. Um, but given my background, given what I've gone through, um, I am going to continue to try to have this audacious effort to make these large mega podcast, these mega blogs that are really everything I think about and that I've learned about and I've I've considered in the last maybe 10 years of, of education and treating people and reading the science, try to put this into a digestible, um, understandable and, and uh, useful reference for everyone in gymnastics to come find some information to, to help based on how, how somebody can get over back pain or what we can do about back pain. So uh, we're going to kind of start from the outline here and then work our way down. If this is the first podcast, this large podcast you've listened to on injuries, the way we're going to do this is start with just some introduction, talk about, you know, the background of demographics for um, what are the uh, prevalence rates of, of people with back pain. So what does the research tell us about who gets back pain? What are the rates of back pain? What are the common injuries that we see in back pain? And then from there, we'll go down and we'll talk about why maybe that is happening. What are the factors in gymnastics? that are contributing to so many people having back pain, okay? From there, once we understand the underlying um, factors and maybe some of the, the rates, we wanna move on there and just talk a little bit about um, the forces of gymnastics on someone's back and then also the anatomy. We wanna understand the anatomy of the spine to understand what common injuries are going to happen. And so uh, for this episode, because I find it the most helpful, uh, I probably should have done this in the other ones, but I do have spine models here, which if you're just listening to the podcast, um, I got these models. They're fantastic. They're very lifelike. And uh, I will walk through some of the anatomy here and hopefully try to give some good perspective about why there are so many different types of injuries in gymnastics based on bending forward or backwards or landings. And hopefully these models can help kind of clarify some things 
in terms of make, making sure people understand what's going on. So I'll go through the anatomy only at a depth that is understandable for the injuries that we're going to talk about. The spine is extremely complicated. It's a lot of things going on. And as I will talk about, there is a very large difference and maybe some schools of thoughts of some people who are a bit more on the what we call mechanical side of uh, uh, pathology, which is the, you know, the actual structure, anatomy, biomechanics, really making a huge difference in different types of injuries. There's kind of that side of the world. And then there's the other side, which is maybe what is, is referred to more as the pain science development side, which is more about understanding and respecting the anatomy, but thinking more about how maybe global factors or uh, how, how pain is more of an output of the brain is, is a factor in who develops uh, symptoms or doesn't develop pain or symptoms. So I have been really lucky and I guess fortunate that I've spent a lot of time studying a lot of these different areas of the research. So, um, you know, people like Stuart McGill or uh, Mackenzie, Paul Hodges, Saruman, uh, uh, Butler and Mosley, who are more on the pain science side, and O'Sullivan, some other people. I've tried my best to study all of these systems and put them together into what I feel is a really useful way to treat somebody or work with someone. So I'll talk about those different systems as we get down to the medical side. But just the point I'm trying to make is that I personally believe that these mechanical versus pain science things have more overlap than difference. So you'll hear me talk a lot about both of those things. So we'll go into the anatomy only as it relates to injuries. And then from there, we'll talk about, okay, what are the, the different categories that uh, people get back pain in? So forward, backwards, landing, and what um, structures or what um, different areas of that anatomy do we think are involved? And it's really important to know the anatomy and what injuries kind of correlate to that because different movements will stress different areas of the lower back. And as a result, there will be very, very different exercise strategies that we use to help somebody uh, get over their back pain, right? And then get back to gymnastics. And the other reason it's really important to understand the different movements and the different types of anatomy is gymnastics has a variety of stresses that it can put on someone's lower back. So while it's common for someone to have backward base bending pain, say back walkovers, back handsprings, back tumbling, your chancos, um, it's common. It's not the only type of back pain that somebody gets in gymnastics. And I think that is a important thing to start from the beginning and kind of dispel is that not all back pain in a gymnast is related to a stress fracture or the a spondy fracture, as they're commonly called. I treat many, many gymnasts for forward-based pain and impact-based pain, which is very different than, you know, someone who is going through maybe backwards-based pain. So we have to understand the anatomy and we have to understand the different forces on the back to maybe get a, a keyword into what skills are starting to bother them the most and, and are maybe sparking their pain versus what skills are sore after somebody has gone through some, some time of back pain, because that will help us know what do we think is going on from a, a diagnosis point of view. And then that really makes a huge difference on how we treat somebody. Okay. So once we get down to the uh, actual injury side, I'll talk about all the different times forwards, backwards, and I will share exactly the exact um, tests and the exact assessment tools that I use to try to figure out does someone have pain going forward or backwards or impact, which is a huge deal to guide how I treat somebody. So rather than, you know, dance around things and say, buy this course or blah, 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 there are courses online if you want to buy it for our, we have for this, I'd rather just give you everything and, and make it accessible to everybody so that more gymnasts can get the help they need. If, if a medical provider out there hears this podcast and hears the way that I assess somebody and says, mm, I'll try that and they get to the clinic and they try something, maybe they catch something that they wouldn't otherwise catch because they have more information. So this is in an effort to try to give as much as I possibly can to the gymnastics community so that more athletes can get the help they need and more medical providers can feel as though they're confident to treat something that's sometimes very intimidating, which is a gymnast with lower back pain. Uh, and then also that parents maybe feel as though they have somewhere to, to get good information that they can refer to other people. So we'll go through specific injuries. We'll talk about the different assessment tools we use, and then we'll then move into talking about timelines for injuries. So what are the different timelines to expect? We'll talk about bracing versus not bracing. Um, and then essentially exactly what I do in these stages of rehab. So what do I do in the very, very beginning back pain when someone is really in a, in a tough spot and they're having a lot of pain what can we do to reduce their symptoms or reduce their pain then what can we do in the middle stages to try to get somebody stronger and get somebody reconditioned back to the forces that are on their spine what do we do in the advanced phases of rehab for uh, getting back to jumping and running and impact and basic gymnastic skills and then what are we going to do to slowly get somebody back into gymnastics with the return to sport protocol i'll share exactly what i do 
uh, how do I make these programs to make sure somebody is uh, safe going through the entire uh, uh, return to sport process. And then lastly, we'll talk about some maintenance and prevention stuff. What can we do to reduce the risk of back injuries in gymnastics? And then how do we make sure that if someone is, is struggling with back pain, so they have a challenging case, um, what can we do to help them maybe get over that? And um, I've unfortunately, I say this unfortunate because I wish people didn't have back pain. I've unfortunately dealt with uh, easily a thousand cases of back pain in the last, you know, five to 10 years. Um, and a lot of those cases have been great. They go well, smooth. Um, we, we work it out really well. Some cases though have been really hard. Some cases have been really challenging to the case, to the uh, point where someone doesn't get better. Um, we can't seem to figure out why they have pain. Um, the athlete doesn't get back to the skill level they want. Sometimes they move on from the sport because they, they determine that they don't want to continue to try to risk some issues in their back. Um, but that being said, I, I have had some experience on really tricky cases. And so I'd like to highlight some of the things that I found were challenging and hopefully offer some solutions for someone who's dealing with someone that doesn't seem to be getting better of some avenues to explore. All right. All right. So that being said, let's start with just a background, um, uh, epidemiology studies they're called, which essentially is looking at different areas of the research and trying to understand how common are these injuries in gymnastics. So I've pulled up some studies here that I will mention. If you're not a geek like me and you don't want to hear these, just breeze through it and kind of get the information. But depending on what you look at, um, in the, in the research, there's a big variety of what type, like how common back pain is, right? So in, in some studies, uh, depending on the it's a systematic review or a meta-analysis or a um, uh, review of the literature, they will take all of the studies that they have on low back pain and gymnasts and they'll put them together and they'll give you some composite values. So if you look at the studies, right, you can see that up to 71% of all injuries that are reported have to do with lower back pain. Okay. So uh, in that being said, it's very, very common, right? So if you take a study of a, a small amount of people, right, say like an elite team, and you say, what's the prevalence in that six month window? You might say up to like 71% or even up to 90% of all those athletes have back pain, small sample size, very high level of the sport. So sometimes that happens, which is why you get that extreme end. Okay. But another interesting stat around that 70% is you look at some of the differences in who will experience back pain, right? Up to about, you know, 65% of females and 85% of males based on the study might report having back pain at some way, shape or form. And this is where it comes into a difference between the research and the real world. In, in the studies, right? 65 to 75% of people reporting back pain, female gymnast, right? And then 85% of males, that's a lot. That's a really a lot, about three quarters, right? So the research says that in my personal life though, and all the people I've treated being in gymnastics since I was two, right? Being an athlete, being a coach, I have never, and I mean, never met a gymnast who did not have some bout of back pain, right? So anecdotally to myself, it's hundred <laughs> percent. Everyone I've ever met has had back pain in some way, shape or form. Okay. But then on the research, they might only report injuries that are so bad. They have to miss training, right. Or they have to miss competition or there's some sort of support for why they're in rehab. So keep that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Whereas the, again, the research may say that ankle sprains and knee in, uh, injuries are more common and are more of a problem. I personally have see, never seen somebody not have back pain that kept them out of training. They just kind of, you know, grunted their way through it and maybe didn't report it to their medical staff, which is a problem, but that's the reality of the, the culture that we're living in. So at the club level, um, Vanti 2010 looked at 91 Italian gymnasts, uh, ages 11 to 14. And they found that it was about a 25% to 65% prevalence, meaning that, you know, when you look at one snapshot in time over a window between 25 and 65% of the gymnasts reported back pain or back injuries. Okay. Uh, Saloon in 2015, a 21 year study of uh, 360, 3,681 athletes over a 10 year period, or sorry, over that 21 year period, the instance was anywhere between 11.1, right? 11.1% to a little bit higher, 11.3, um, based on the interval you look at. And uh, about 400 back injuries were reported, okay? In O'Kane, 2011, 96 gymnasts from level four to level 10, 8.8% of the injuries were acute back pain, and then 18% of the overuse injuries were lower back pain as well. Okay, so a little bit, little bit higher there, but at the club level, usually not as much training for some lower level athletes and not as demanding skills. So maybe the prevalence rates are pretty are lower compared to maybe college or elite. Okay. So in the college level, um, Marshall 2007 reported that the uh, low back pain was the third most common in the NCAA um, at 6%, but only acute injuries. Okay. And again, we get back to these caveats here of, I guarantee you that college gymnasts are not only having acute back pain, a lot of them are having low back pain chronically. Okay. So those probably weren't reported because they wanted to train, they wanted to compete, 
they didn't want to, you know, speak up about it, but that's a, a conversation for a different time. Okay. Cure 2015, uh, again, third most common in the NCAA, but um, 11 uh, sorry, 13.4% was reported. However, they were all lumped together as trunk injuries. Okay. So a trunk injury could be lower back, middle back. Uh, you could even argue it could be like the obliques, the sides. Like it's hard to differentiate between true low back issues or maybe upper back or some other areas of the body, but 13.4% was their uh, reported rate. Okay. Sands in 1993, uh, 458 low back injuries out of 4,470 total injuries over a five year period in Division One college. Okay, so about 500 rounding up there out of 4,500. That's a pretty substantial amount. That's probably in the 20% range of all the injuries in that college program from uh, five years at a D1 college were to the lower back. And then looking at the elite level, okay, Colt 1999, uh, it was the second most common injury in an 18 month study of elite gymnasts, uh, around 14.9%. And then FET, 2000, uh, sorry, FET 2017 was a survey of 32 G uh, German elite gymnasts, and they had a 92.8 lifetime prevalence, okay? So what that means is that all of those gymnasts over the course of their, you know, whatever years they looked at this, um, they have had, they reported that over 90% of the gymnasts in that subgroup had some sort of back injury that probably kept them out of training or competition. And then they found that in a six month prevalence, just looking back in the last three to six months, how many, um, how, how many of you have had back pain or back injuries? 68.8% reported that they, they had a back injury. Okay. So what that tells you is that as you increase up the level of difficulty in gymnastics from uh, recreational to club, to elite, to college, and this is again, across multiple avenues of the sport, um, you see that the rates of lower back injuries climbs up substantially. Uh, and there's many reasons for that, which we'll move on to next. But I think that's the first thing to remember is that as you increase your difficulty level in gymnastics, as the hours go up, as the skill level goes up, as the forces go up, you have to really be aware that lower back pain is probably going to be something we have to keep an eye on. And that low back injuries are going to be more common in these people than maybe uh, the lower levels or the less competitive levels or the recreational levels. Okay. So that's some background there. So let's talk about some of the contributing factors to why people have lower back pain, right? So number one, I think you have to embrace the reality and look at how incredibly high force the sport is. So the forces in gymnastics are not only substantial, they're also very different. So you can have in gymnastics, you can have forward bending forces, backward bending forces, shearing forces between different areas of the lower back compression forces, you can have many different types of forces that are pushing down on the athlete. You can also have traction forces, which are more uh, rare in gymnastics, because we swing high bar, um, dismounts, Takachev taps, uh, ring taps, all that kind of stuff. So you look at the the forces across some biomechanical data, it's pretty mind boggling to see these forces, right? The landing forces I talked about in other podcasts are like 15 to 18 times body weight, and then 23 times body weight in the ankle. Those are wild. Don't get me wrong. Those are really wild. But some of the forces reported in the lower back are are really, really wild to think about too. So when you look at the research, uh, a lot of this research comes from, again, um, biomechanical data and some of the textbooks that I'll put in the show notes. But the compression forces during tumbling on floor are about 6.5 times body weight. So when you hit the floor and you're rounding and you're doing like, you know, a change, a shape changing or corbett action or a hollow arch snap, hitting the ground in those positions has been measured up to 6.5 percent or sorry, 6.5 times body weight. So landings, like I just said, while the landing forces are, you know, 15 to 18 to 23, the landing compression forces on the lower back that have been measured are anywhere between 11.6 to 14.8 times body weight, which is wild. That's a lot of force and compression on someone's lower back. Okay. Shearing forces at the disc, the lower back disc that we'll talk about later have been measured between, you know, low threes, but up to a 3.5 times body weight. So that's the, the forces moving back and forth this way, um, front to back shearing on the spine. Okay. And this one is mind boggling. The highest recorded compression force during a flexed landing. So rounding of your back and hollowing leaning in forward is 40 times body weight. And as we'll talk about was that relates to uh, disc pathology or flexion intolerant low back pain, you can have someone who has a ridiculous amount of pain because it's a lot of pressure on the nerves in the back of the, uh, the lower back, the, uh, sorry, the, the back side of the lower backs so on, on the posterior elements of the back. So that's really important to remember because I think landing, jumping and landing is something that still has yet to be mastered and used really, really well in gymnastics. So if someone is landing, doing a skill in a hollow shape, but doesn't understand how to land in a proper squat pattern and lands very flexed, 
those forces are astronomical and will be put through the lower back of a gymnast. And it's a very, very common reason why somebody has chronic back pain um, because they constantly land in a flex body position and then they go and they do in bars or they tumble and they round their back and it, and it makes the disc very, very sensitive or the nerves very, very sensitive and might cause them like sciatica or stuff like that. Right. The pain science world would say it's just, you know, sensitive tissues and flexion and tolerant. I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole, but both things can cause problems, <laughs> problems. So other couple little ones to mention here, um, front and back tucks are 1.4 and 2.2 times body weight, respectively. Um, a Takachev tap prior to release uh, at the L5 S1 level for shearing forces is about four times body weight. And then the uh, compression at the junction between the thoracic spine, the upper back and the lower back um, during release is about four times body weight and about three point times in shearing forces quite a bit there. And then lastly, the downward swing of a ring giant is anywhere between 6.5 to 9.3 times body weight. Okay. And so I review all these forces because we see a variety of different forces showing up in very high amounts on the back. You have rounding forces, you have back bending forces, you have traction forces, you have compression forces because of all these forces each of these types of things can possibly cause some irritation to someone's lower back. Because of that, we have to have an assessment system that looks at these different forward backwards compression that tests these things to see which motions are provoking pain and which motions may be alleviating pain. And that's going to guide a lot of our treatment system for how we use our acute rehab phases strategies to get someone out of pain and then what motions we're really careful about adding back in during the advanced or the return to sport phase, because those symptoms that came on with those certain motions, we're going to want to be careful about those down the road. All right. So that's kind of the big first one to start with is the forces themselves. Along with that, the second thing to think about is the workloads and the repetitions. Okay. Gymnastics is very, very demanding and it requires quite a lot of um, repetition to master skills properly. So basics and drills and event time skills, routines, it requires so many repetitions of say, for example, a, a kip drill and kips to get your kip. And that's a lot of rounding that might happen on someone's spine over a long time and it can make their back sore. Vice versa, if you look at gymnastics, there are a lot of skills that involve backwards bending. Front handspring, back handspring, front walkover, back walkover, um, your chankos, uh, releases on uh, bars, back handsprings on beam, series on beam, layout step out, front aerial, right? There's a lot of stuff on women's gymnastics that can add up over and over for backbending. Then you look at men's gymnastics, there's a ton of things that can involve certain backbending or forward bending too, right? In bars, peaches, um, back tumbling, front tumbling, uh, double backs, uh, jams, um, all sorts of stuff, right? Piking in for vaults, all sorts of stuff in artistic gymnastics that can very easily cause a repetitive pattern to develop. And then you have uh, sports like trampoline and tumbling, right? Where there's so much compression over and over and over that it's common for someone to get back pain with compression or landing based issues. And these are all things that I've seen in the real world and treated many, many people for. So I can confidently say that different are, uh, domains of the sport have a lot of overuse type impact or back bending or forward. And then rhythmic, for example, requires extreme backbending range of motion. All of those extreme backbends, even though the forces maybe aren't as high as like a, a Yurchenko vault or something like an in-bar, they still can come with high, high, high repetition in pushing someone's lower back to the extreme ranges of their flexibility. Those high workloads and those high repetitions can very easily cause someone's back to become irritable. So with that in mind, one of the solutions we'll talk about is having to track and having to think about what are the different skill categories we're working on different events, different days, or how are we going to plan that across the week, right? We can't just do for women's artistic, for example, we can't just say, okay, we're doing 10, uh, 10 series on beam with a whole bunch of routines. Then we're going to go tumble on floor. Then we're doing 10 year chankos. Then we're going to go to bars and we're going to do 10 chapashes or releases, right? Or 10 free hips even, right? All of those back bends and all of those extensions are going to add up very quickly and can make someone's back get really irritable. So maybe we rotate one event that we're not doing so much back bending type work, or we plan across the week uh, how to spread those things out. Or we say we put a maybe a cap on how many we're going to do. You're going to do, uh, I want you to hit five beam series. Don't go more than seven, including your drills in the ground and stuff like that, because we're cautious about this, right? We're not just going to go do beam for an hour and say, do as many, uh, flight series as you can get in 
in 45 minutes uh, because we got to go hard today, right? Like that's going to get someone into the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 backbends very, very fast. So workloads are another thing that really has to be taken seriously because that can be a huge, huge issue for people in gymnastics. If they don't respect those, if they don't slowly work those things. All right. The next thing we have to talk about is this is where flexibility issues tend to become a little bit more prominent in the conversation. In the first two episodes, talking about ankle injuries and lower back, or sorry, ankle injuries and knee injuries. I mentioned flexibility because I think it's important to deal with. Um, but in this situation, it's very, very important that with high extreme ranges of motion and skills, like a back handspring, for example, or a back walkover, that bend has to be equally spread out throughout the entire body. So if we have someone who who isn't really flexible in their shoulders or their hips or their upper back, it's very common to put more pressure on the lower back with what's called the hinge point loading. Okay. And what I tell people when I, when I talk with them about injuries is that when you look at the arch, right, you should see someone who has about 25% coming from each area of their body, 25% from their shoulders, 25% from their upper back, or what's called the thoracic spine, 25% from their lower back, because the back will need to arch a little bit and 25% from their hips. If you don't have that nice, smooth, equal bend, you put all the pressure on your lower back. And it might be a situation where you have 10% from your shoulders, 10% from your upper back, 10% from your hips, and 70% from your middle back, causing that really extreme kind of hinge or back bending based motion. So it's really, really important here that one, we're screening for flexibility in the shoulders and the, in the upper back and the hips. And then we are accurately doing science-based flexibility methods to manage the soft tissue and not stretch out people's joint capsules and think about what actually makes sustainable progress over time. Okay, the research shows us that consistency is more important than intensity. We want to be stretching, you know, two to two to sets of, of 30 seconds every single day, five to six days per week with proper stretches and strengthening behind that to make significant changes in flexibility range of motion. We have very in-depth podcasts and full tutorials on exactly how to improve overhead shoulder flexibility, exactly how to improve hip flexibility, split flexibility, leap flexibility. So I'm not going to spend an hour on just that category, but we have to realize that if we're not using science-based flexibility methods that are in line with what we know is going to get someone more mobile, particularly kids who are growing, we're going to constantly fight this uphill battle of the shoulders and the hips not moving enough and putting more pressure on their lower back. And the exact same thing can happen for other categories of back pain rounding for example if we don't understand how to develop a really good pike stretch with making sure that the nerves are not irritable in the back of the leg making sure that the lower back can round a little bit comfortably making sure that the hips can flex and making sure that the back of the leg the soft tissue and the hamstrings is nice and mobile if we don't have a really good system to, to get someone's pike stretch to develop that doesn't involve just doing a pike stretch pulling their toes up and pushing them down which is not going to be a good out term, uh, long-term outcome. Um, that's going to put a lot of pressure on their lower back. Okay. And then landing as well with compression based issues. If we don't have good ankle flexibility and a good squat, uh, flexibility to get yourself lower to 90 degrees with the hips and the ankles moving together, someone's lower back might flex or extend to cheat and try to make up that range of motion. So it's very, very important that young athletes that are being coached are using proper flexibility methods to take pressure off their lower back and make sure that all areas are trying to help out to absorb force. Okay. So the next one here is going to be what I think a lot of people jump to first, which is something that I, I think is important, but I don't think it's more important than the first three, which is understanding the forces, uh, workloads, strength and conditioning being used to do that, which is next. But I wanted to mention this because so many people talk about this. So the core, the core is a collection of muscles we'll talk about and it supports the spine. And so many people I hear about go to a medical provider or even from their coach here, your core is just weak. Your core is not strong enough. If you just, if you got stronger core, you wouldn't have back pain. Now, while I do think that in some athletes that more core strength is important. And also while I do think that as a coach, core conditioning is vital and you have to do it every single day to a high degree. Think about the nature of the argument, right? If all we needed in gymnastics was more core strength to make back pain go away, a lot of people in gymnastics would not have back pain because I know a lot of gymnasts that do core every single day, hard leg lifts, hollow rocks, uh, V ups, arch ups, side planks, tons and tons and tons of core work. And I still know a lot of people with back pain in gymnastics. So while there is a subset of people, particularly the younger athletes who are very hypermobile, 
maybe who don't have the best body control or stiffness during their technique, they don't have great technique, they may need more core bracing strategies and strength because the forces that I mentioned above are too much for them to handle. And when they try to do these skills, it puts a lot of pressure on their lower back. There are definitely cases that I've seen like that. That being said, I think the more uh, common situations is that it's core control, which is the issue. And shout out to my friend, Dr. Josh Eldridge, who popularized this in like 2013, for me anyways. But core control is more the ability to connect your brain to your muscles in your spine and brace in a way that uses all of those muscles to protect you against the high forces, okay? So that's a little bit different. And you need to understand how to brace those core muscles how to breathe properly and try to use all of those muscles as a unit protecting your, your lower back against those high forces. That's very different than someone who just needs to do 50 more leg lifts per day. Okay. And I believe that core control is more so an issue in gymnasts because they oftentimes are doing such high intensity, fast skills that we maybe skip steps and don't teach them how to brace and breathe. And also, as I'll talk about next, we don't do conditioning styles that are in line with general principles and gymnastics specific and put somebody under load, under weights, dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells, where they are forced to brace their core under a high degree of external load. And so what happens is we have this mismatch of they don't understand how to brace their core properly and breathe properly, how to move their arms and their legs around that core brace. And then we don't use conditioning that exposes them to higher forces that requires them to breathe and use that brace under load, not just jumping and gymnastics skills. And it causes a situation where someone's maybe not going to be able to tolerate a one and a half punch front. They lose their core and they buckle and it, and it jars their back. It's very common for someone who has some stress reaction. Okay. Also, maybe it's a situation where someone doesn't understand how to brace their core. They don't get this core conditioning. So the bottom of a ring giant, the bottom of a Takachev tap, the bottom of a giant, they're not really strong there and they don't know how to brace and it pulls in their back and it causes quite a bit of pain. So in my mind, I think core control is probably more of the issue. And I'll talk about exercises I really like for that. And then I also think moving on to this is that strength and conditioning still is a huge area of gymnastics that requires an update. It requires science-based updates and really good understanding of hybrid methodology between weight training and general training, and sorry, gymnastics training to get the best of both worlds. Like I said, we need core strength. We need leg lifts. We need rope climbs. We need handstands. We need plyo mats. We need all that kind of stuff. It's very, very important. But as the research shows us, if we don't use external loading, how are we ever going to get somebody's body conditioned to handle those forces that I mentioned above that are astronomical on their back? Okay. Along with that, how are we going to get someone's legs powerful enough and strong enough to handle the forces of gymnastics, progress in their skill level and get themselves to, to reach their goals while also protecting their lower back? The legs the core works so much together that if you don't have really strong legs, it's very easy for your lower back to take more of a burden. Okay. And I'm all about gymnastics, traditional methods of doing some things with plyos and panel mats and running drills and all the things you need for event specific work. But I'm telling you, if we never put weight in the athlete's hands, how in the world are they going to develop the capacity to handle the forces that come through their legs and the, through their back? Okay. So that's a huge factor that I still really see is we really need to adopt science-based hybrid models where we use weight training and we use gymnastics-specific training, particularly introducing that around 10 to 12 years old, just the basics, and then loading them properly, particularly through puberty. That will help us substantially to develop their ability to handle these forces, handle more repetitions, and get higher capacity for performance-wise, but also protect their lower back. So every single rehab program I've ever made for a gymnast uses weights in their rehab process, okay? So I, I just hope that's clear that that's something that's going to help you not cause you to lose your flexibility, not make you bulky, not make you get hurt more if it's properly done with a science-based uh, strategy and also a proper coaching progression. All right. So in that mind, as we move on to it, what's the next thing to think about? Well, the reality is that gymnastics is still culturally in a place where it takes very, very young athletes who are pre-puberty and it asks them to do, it asks them to do incredibly hard skills in that young window of 10 to 14 in particular. So the majority of people in gymnastics are kids pre-puberty, who as I've talked about in other episodes, if you look at the research, Esteban Balier, many other great people in the uh, Lloyd and strength and development world, um, Lloyd Oliver, um, they are, Lloyd and Oliver, sorry, I want to give justice. Um, they are explaining how someone is not at their peak level of strength or power 
or capacity cardiovascular wise at these ages of 10 to 14. They're very much underdeveloped. They don't have the full strength. The bone maturation is not quite there. And they also don't have all the capacity to do some of these high force skills. They may be more um, able to develop their flexibility really, really well and also have a great learning capacity to learn skills and drills, which I think is fantastic. You can train high level gymnastics at a young age with a great coach who's going to work you through the steps and train hard. It's great as long as the training hours are not too crazy. Um, but they're not going to be strong enough and more powerful enough to handle some of these insane skills. And it brings up a conversation of what are we doing with developmental programs around the world, asking kids to do your chankos and, you know, really intense giants and really intense floor passes when maybe they don't have the strength or the power or the cardiovascular capacity to develop that. Maybe it's a big reason why their backs are getting sore. So a cultural problem there talking about maybe the pace in which we move athletes, the age limits around certain competitions, the maybe age limits around what skills, when do we allow D and E value skills to be competed for safety? Just like maybe we need to think about doing some sort of a uh, count of how many impacts and landings they take or backbends, right? Maybe we need like baseball has and has been talked about in a couple other uh, friends of mine podcast, Ellen Casey and many others. Maybe we need to talk about a hyperextension count for gymnasts or an impact count or a punch count for gymnasts to make sure that we're not putting too much pressure on them per week in the same way that baseball has a throwing count, a pitch count. I'm really lucky that my bosses, Mike Ronald, Lenny Macrina, and their mentors, Kevin Wilk, James Andrews, many other people, were pioneers in the technology and in the um, science and the research that developed pitch counts for youth baseball because there were so many kids having UCL tears and in, 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 uh, getting Tommy John surgery at a young age. Maybe we need to have a conversation about what is the proper dosage per week of impacts and hyperextensions that we need to be available to, to give the coaches to not let those things get too out of control. So that's another factor to talk about as well. And then lastly, just a couple more here. The lack of medical care, evidence-based medical care around gymnastics, largely because it's a lack of science and research and funding is still a huge deal. Uh, a lot of medical providers are kind of left in the dark, not knowing what types of exercises to do and how to treat someone, how to evaluate someone, how to get somebody back to sport safely. So that is a very, very important area of the research that needs to be developed as well. I've tried my best to do a lot of coursework here, education. This podcast is a perfect example, but we desperately need more great high quality research and education around making sure that doctors know what gymnastics requires, making sure ATs and PTs and sports chiros know what gymnastics requires and how to get somebody back. I'm, I'm really lucky that people come to me and say, you know, you're a medical provider who understands this and we, we don't really get this elsewhere. Um, I'm flattered by that, but I don't want that to be the case, right? I want all gymnasts to get the care they deserve and need. And so we need more people to be trained and educated on gymnastics specific populations. Okay, last two here. Um, so technique and basics, I'll be really, really uh, crucial here. So you have to have somebody coaching wise that understands basic technique, basic uh, body awareness, proper drill progression and how to dose somebody properly to safely develop these skills that are very high level on their back. If we don't have great technical awareness from a coaching point of view, and then on the athlete, if the athlete is not disciplined and dedicated to learning and using and practicing proper technique, we really might always have a position of, of risk where someone's back is always sore. I know the reality as a coach of working with young athletes. There's some athletes that develop back pain. And I tell them over and over again, let's fix this technique. Let's fix this round off. Let's fix our board stiff. Let's do more strength conditioning. Let's be more dedicated here. And it just doesn't land. They, they don't really think about core bracing and proper back bending and proper technique and their back always bugs them. And so until we take a step back and really talk about goals and alignment of those goals with uh, everybody else and explain why it's so important to make sure that someone's back is not being overworked with proper technique, you have to have that conversation, right? You can only tell someone so much to fix their technique and, and make sure they backbend or tumble properly or land properly or do their giants properly and not arch over in a banana and tap at the right time. Someone has to take the um, responsibility and, the, uh, and have the initiative to want to learn that to make sure that their back doesn't get better. Flip side of the coin, we need coaches who are educated and understand what is proper technique. How do I teach proper giants? How do I teach proper kips? How do I teach a good round off? How do I make sure someone understands bounding and stiffness and rebounding to not buckle on their back? So a lot of things can happen there together as an educational point of view. My buddy, Nick Ruddick has an enormous amount of great stuff online for that. I've tried to share. There are great coaches out there at the elite world. Uh, Amy Borman, many others that have shared their techniques and things that are work, uh, working for them. Um, and many people on the podcast have come on here. Sarah Korngold and other people from Ascend have talked about technique and talked about those things. So kind of soaking up that knowledge and using that is really, really important to reduce the risk of stuff going on. 
All right. Landing technique goes along with that. Um, you have to make sure you're landing properly, as I talked about. There's a study in 2019 in the International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy by San Beca, San Bico, who is the lead author there, showed that in 30 elite gymnasts, uh, they tended to land with a very overextended lower back position and less of a squat. So they were absorbing some of those forces in their lower back, not so in a nice neutral position in a proper landing pattern that might give them a little bit less force on their back and spread the force out to their legs. I've seen a lot of gymnasts, like I said, who don't know how to land without hollowing, and it puts a lot of pressure on that back. Remember that 40 times compression and flex spine posture that happens during landing. So that is an issue, right? And then a lot of these times, the landing problems will show up over and over and over again, where somebody can't get back to gymnastics because they never fix how they land and their technique, and it constantly sparks more irritation of their back. So proper landing patterns are going to be really, really important to correct and someone who is going through the advanced phase of rehab. Okay. And then lastly, just a reality. Gymnastics has gotten so much harder in the last 10 years. Like the equipment has progressed. The level of the athletes and uh, have skill level have progressed because some athletes are just incredibly talented and incredibly hardworking. We're seeing more and more high level skills being pushed at the elite level of all these disciplines, which trickles down to make the lower levels much, much harder as well. So that is uh, something that is great to see because the sport is incredible and I love it, but it also puts a lot of pressure on the younger levels, uh, the younger ages to develop really high level skills maybe earlier because the overall skill level is so high. Okay. So those are a lot of things to think about. Many different factors, right? Culture is also a problem we'll talk about uh, mixed in there. Also the workload data needing, needing measurements, like we need tools to measure impact and hyperextensions. That's very, very important. You know, all of this stuff comes together along with, you know, early specialization and year round training, which has been comp conversation topics for many other areas. All these things come together and maybe create a lot of lower back pain, right? Along with maybe athletes who just don't report that they have back pain, like I talked about, and it's on them to, to seek out attention and get help. So cultural issues, I just mentioned, though, if someone speaks up about back pain, the coach puts it, you know, ignores it or, or disregards it a little bit. Someone's fearful to speak up trust issues, right? We'll talk about that at the end about a cultural problem, but that's a huge problem as well. But many factors to think about, many ideas. I wanted to make sure I went slow and understood this. Um, Please keep in mind, this is going to be a long podcast, so I'm going slow on purpose. So someone has everything they need uh, possibly down the road. And we're 40 minutes in and we've talked about factors, <laughs> so it's okay. All right. So let's kind of go through the anatomy. We'll, we'll go through this only in a way that it relates to the injuries we're going to talk about. Okay. And so for me, let me just take a sip real quick. For me, there's many different systems here that I talked about that I believe in, that I use. Okay. Stuart McGill, really great researcher here. Lots of great information. Uh, McKenzie is, is the classic uh, kind of treatment for disc disc based pain or flexion and extension based pain. Look, took those courses; they were wonderful. Paul Hodges, great researcher here. Shirley Saruman, great researcher here. David Butler, Lorimer Mosley, phenomenal um, pain science researchers. Adrian Lau as well. I took their courses; I love them. I use those analogies as well sometimes. I think they're phenomenal. A lot of that stuff goes into how I treat people. Uh, Peter O'Sullivan is another really good resource here. So I'm not going to go through all the con ed and things for people to study, but if you're a practitioner and you're trying to learn about all these things I'm going to mention, these books, these courses that I've, this is what I've taken the last 10 years have been really, really helpful. I, I, I went hard in the con ed department for the first three years of my career with these people. And I really, really learned a ton. So let's talk about anatomy and I'll use these models here to make things a little bit easier. So we're going to go through a little bit of a, an overall and a layered approach here. So the layered approach helps people conceptualize. So when you look at someone's lower back, and I'll, I'll show this model from the side here, right? The lower back at the main level, the deepest part of the spine are essentially bones and discs that are alternating. So you have bones up here, what are called the vertebral bodies. Then you also have a disc in between here, right? That then meets another vertebral body. So at a base level from the front, you can see how these discs kind of sit on top of each other like sandwiches, right? And I know people hate the jelly donut analogy, but for consumers to learn who have know nothing about the spine, we're going to refer to that model. Okay. So what you can see here is that based on how the spine moves. So if I bend forward, right, you can see how the, the pressure makes the disc change at height back here a little bit. And then if I back bend, right, you can see that change. So when I back bend, the front moves a little bit more, it fills up with some of the disc material I'll talk about. And then when you move backwards, right, so back and forth here. So this is the front, right, alternating. If you look at the top here, you can see what a disc kind of looks like. So on the outside, you can see what's called the annular wall, right? This is the outer casing of a disc. 
it kind of holds in some of the fluid. Okay. So in the outside, this is a firm collagen ring. Okay. It's, it provides quite a bit of support. It buffers against heavy rotational forces. If you look at the fibers from the front here, they're angled at 45 degrees back and forth. It's kind of hard to see here, but you can see they're kind of angled more at a 45 degree angle. So what that does, is it allows for a lot of compression tolerance, but not a lot of twisting tolerance. Okay. So it helps against some of these compression forces, bending forces. And also really importantly, it creates kind of a closed vacuum system. So this is really hard to hold. Sorry for everybody. I'm trying to do this backwards in my camera, but, um, this outside, right. Creates a nice closed vacuum sealed pressure that allows the disc to move in different directions, right? If we don't have that nice closed system of a, of a vacuum seal, it's hard for the fluid to move back and forth in a nice, in a nice compression or, you know, flexion extension motion. So, we have this outer ring called the annular wall, which keeps in the inner part, right? Which is kind of a gel-like substance, okay? So because we have this gel-like substance in the middle, it can buffer forces. You can see how high the disc is, how, how, how um, height-wise it has a lot of space there. But that's a lot of times because we have this cushion absorption of the gel inside of the disc, okay? So this response to movement happens when the, when somebody moves forward or backwards or, or, you know, lands heavy like this, you can see that this inner kind of material of the gel is moving in different directions. So if I bend forward, right, if I were to lean forward, it would go in one direction. If I would bend backwards, it would go in another direction. It shifts forward and backwards side to side based on the way you're moving. Okay, this inside gel called the nucleus propulsa is really what the, the shock absorber kind of is, is for the for the lower back, right? So this moves in opposite directions, mostly to the movement that you're doing. So if I bend forward, the, the nucleus kind of moves backwards. If I bend backwards, it kind of moves forwards. If I bend sideways, it moves the opposite way, right? And that's important to understand for some of the disc issues that we'll talk about down the road with heavy compression forces and landing. Okay, so you have to realize that not only does this help to buffer forces, there's also a lot of, of, of blood vessels and nerves and stuff you can see inside here that help to provide uh, nutrition and help to provide some of the, the um, recovery that you need for the area. So outer, right, firmer, more um, fibrocartilage, inner, more gel-like, uh, has blood vessels and nerves that can be can creating some... Um, uh, the back pain world we call nociceptive fibers that can transmit pain up to the or transmit signals of danger up to the, the brain body would put a, a pain output a neurotag then you have the mechanical world who would say that the actual annular wall those fibers can refer some pain and cause some some disruption of tissue inflammation you can have some localized tissue uh, sensitivity from uh, pain or injury or inflammation all right so i don't want to go super in depth past that with the death with the distance stuff like that but just keep that in mind outer wall inner gel right and then like i said front to back motions change that. And then you can see how side to side motions would change that. If I go side to side like that, you can see it moving in opposite directions, right? And then compression, for example, right? Compression kind of makes the entire disc sink down a little bit as the force is getting uh, absorbed. So that being said, now when you look at the back, right? You can see this is the back. These are the pointy things that point out of your back, right? This is called the spinous process, right? And then you have on the sides here, what are called transverse processes, right? So you can see now if I bend forward, right? Or if a gymnast bends forward, you can see how those joints open. These are called facet joints. Okay. So they open when someone bends forward and importantly for a gymnast, they close when someone's bends, bends backwards, right? So if I bend backwards, you can see how there's less space between those joints. And you can also see how there's maybe less space between the spinous process and the back here. All right. And the reason that matters is because when somebody back bends, sometimes in gymnastics, you have extreme back bending motions, or also you can have impact based issues that cause these joints to get cranky, but also cause maybe these bones to bump into each other and get uh, bruised, or also cause very importantly, this area, right, right between you can see it here between these joints. This is called the pars articularis. And it's the, it's the site of, of stress fractures in gymnastics, right? So uh, if somebody bends backwards a lot, or if somebody has a lot of impact and arching together, what happens is that these joints can no longer move more and it starts to put pressure on this bone right here. And it causes in an arch specifically, it causes one bone to start to move forward, right? And this other model I can show you has this. So we'll go through the actual injuries here, but you can see how if I keep back bending or landing over and over again, it can put pressure right where this, this line is here. See that little gap, right? See how it's not connected. What happens there is that you can put so much pressure with landing that one disc starts to slide and one vertebrae starts to slide forward over each other. And right, that is what happens with the stress fractures that these bones, this pars articularis and what's called the neural arch, it fractures right here, right? And someone on the top one, you can see it, right? And what happens is because that fractures, that bone on top, starts to slide forward, 
And that's obviously not good because the, the fracture site is, is, is painful and awful, but also it starts to move forward like this if it keeps going. And that's what, that's what a spondylolysis is. Spondylo, I'll, I'll go over this later, but you can have a facet syndrome, which is just an irritation of the facet joint, that joint that I talked about right here. That makes common impact. That's a facet joint, right? You can have facet irritation. If keep, things keep going, the next progression is usually a stress reaction, which is when you can see a hairline fracture on MRI or x-ray right here, right? And you can see a fracturing up top as well, right? So you would have a hairline fracture that starts, and then you can have a progression of this, which would be the actual fracture I talked about in the other model. That's a spondylolysis, which is where the pars uh, neural arch actually fractures. If that disc starts to slide forward, that's called the spondylolithesis, right? That's, it refers to sliding of one vertebrae forward over each other, and they grade that based on how far it is, okay? So that's kind of the first bony stuff to understand. We have vertebrae, we have discs in between, we have these joints in the back. Spinous process is this pointy thing that you can feel poking out in your back when you rub it. Outside, transverse processes here on the side. And then, like I said, just as it relates to gymnastics, we have the neural arch and the pars articularis in here, okay? So that's kind of at a, at a baseline level what we have from a bones point of view. All right, now not pictured here, the second layer is going to be a lot of ligaments that kind of run up and down the spine. And the analogy that is used here is kind of like a fishing pole, right? Or a guide wire system to a fishing pole. So we have a lot of ligaments because this is not inherently a really stable structure. We have ligaments that go from body to body so they can connect these two bodies together. We have a lot of ligaments that hold on the front to prevent excessive backbending motion. It's called the anterior longitudinal ligament. We also have ligaments on the back that connect all of these spine, these spine pieces together that prevent excessive flexion forward called the posterior longitudinal ligament. So these ligaments are really, really important because like I said, there's not a lot of inherent stability of the spine. And so we need a lot of things to help us protect it, right? So what they call this in the terminology is a passive subsystem. So we have the bones, disc, joints that interlock together, all the ligaments front, back, between, side to side. I'm not going to go super in depth because people will be asleep. Um, we have a lot of different ligaments here that help us to keep excessive motion happening at the back. We don't want to see a ton of sliding between the, the bones, nor do we want to see a lot of like side bending because we want to protect these, these sensitive structures that were coming up next called the nerves and some of the muscles around it. So we have these very important ligaments, again, anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, there's tons and tons of very, very small ligaments that again, I'm, I'm sparing being really, really nerdy. So I don't want to bore people, but you know, the interspinous ligament, the supraspinatus ligament, the facet capsules, the transverse ligaments, there's lots of stuff here, right? But we have ones that again, the one in the front will limit extension, the one in the back will limit flexion, the ones in the intertransverse will limit side bending side to side, the interspinous ligament will limit rotation and some posterior shearing. Uh, the supraspinous ligament will uh, prevent a lot of really, really forward bending here. And then some of the facet things, you know, they protect against traction forces and stuff. So don't need to know them all, but there's a lot of ligaments that go between joints that go between these processes that help to protect. And they're, it's common that these ligaments, the reason I mentioned them, it's common they can become irritated and inflamed if somebody has repetitive high force or if somebody, you know, has a very rounded posture that they sit, you know, for in school, they go to the gym, they do a bunch of double backs and it bugs their back, right? So lots of ligaments, layer one, lots of the uh, kind of bones, right? Layer two, the ligaments, we have the discs in between, right? And then as you move further, right, you start to have a lot of muscles that are gonna help out here, okay? So the passive subsystem, right, would be the ligaments together, the joint capsules, all that kind of stuff. The active subsystem is muscles. A lot of this is muscles and the nerves that help control those muscles, okay? Now within this category, what we wanna think about is we have, deep muscles and we have superficial muscles okay and i'm not going to go again down the rabbit hole i just want to educate people a little bit so deep muscles tend to be right smaller they're usually seen bridging joint to joint so they're not these large ab muscles that you see on someone they're very small muscles that kind of go between say for example the spinous process of you know one to two or the sorry the transverse process of one to two they bridge different small sideways motions diagonally or one to two up and down here so sometimes you'll hear about these uh, because they're really, really important to stabilize the spine against these, these movements front to back, these micro movements up and down, side to side. They prevent the individual joints themselves from moving too much. And they're really, really important, right? These deeper muscles, right, are smaller. Again, they, they typically work reflexively. So you can't like think about flex my multifidi, right? Like that's one of the muscles that's very commonly talked about, the deep subsystem. 
or the deep uh, active subsystem is the multifidi because it's so important to help stabilize joints side to side. It can be commonly injured in someone who has an irritation, like with a landing posture. But I can't think flex my multifidi, right? Like that's not consciously controllable. The way that's typically we do that is reflexive activation through breathing patterns and bracing patterns that has shown if we breathe and brace properly from um, work from many, many great researchers, Stuart McGill, um, Leon Chateau is a, a breathing researcher who's shown this pretty, really well. If we do this properly, we'll get these muscles to fire pretty well. There was a lot of talk in the 90s about the transverse abdominis, which is another kind of deep muscle. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important, right? Uh, but it's not the most important, you know, it's more important holistically to brace everything together than it is just hollow and use your transverse abdominis as a lot of great research has shown us in high level sports. But essentially back to my point is that the multifidi, things like the rotaries, the transversales, right? These muscles are very small and they go between these ligaments, right? They, sorry, they go between these bones to help stabilize these ligaments, right? They can commonly be irritated if somebody does have a buckling event, like one and a half punch, you can have somebody who maybe does have some multifidi pain. That's a common theory in the research that maybe there is some, some, some causing uh, of, of pain from that structure but they're deep, right? They're deep. They're reflexively activated. Okay. They work to protect the spine at a smaller level. They're not these big giant muscles that we have in our core. Okay. Which leads to the next category, which is the superficial muscles that a lot of us know about. So these ones are typically larger, right? They typically span multiple joints, not just one tiny, tiny level to level joint. Right. And they typically not only, um, work to buffer forces at the core, they create movement, right? So I can, I can fire my obliques brace my core and I can use my obliques to turn side to side. I can flex my rectus abdominis to crunch my abs forward, right? I can consciously think about that because they're larger muscles. We have control over them and, and they're trainable, right? So deeper muscles, these smaller ones go joint to joint, right? A little more reflexive. The bigger ones are very important because they, they help us stabilize these big, big forces. They help us move as well. So these are ones that many people know about. We have deeper, we have the transverse abdominis, right? We have the rectus abdominis in the front, which is like your six pack muscle. We have obliques that run 45 degrees opposite each other, the internal and the external obliques on the back. We have the paraspinals, right? And then the sides, we have what are called QLs, quadratus lumborums, right? A lot of these muscles are large and I include the core as the entire canister, right? Not just the, the lower body, but the ribs, the muscles of the thoracic spine, all of these come together, right? So we have all these muscles together that work and they try to protect the body against it. Importantly, which is commonly not talked about in the core is the top and the bottom of the core. So the top of the core is the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is a dome shaped muscle that flattens out when you breathe and it comes up and down. The proper breathing patterns allow the, the uh, position of the core to be in a way that can handle forces that I'll talk about next, right? Below is the pelvic floor. So the way that I think is really important to think about the core in an analogy is a soup can. I think that's the most digestible, no pun intended, stomach, um, the most kind of uh, understood way to do this. So think about the core of all the muscles surrounding your lower back. Again, the active subsystem is the multifidi muscles, the smaller, deeper ones, plus these bigger muscles is it's like a soup can, right? So on top, you have the diaphragm. On the bottom, you have the pelvic floor. On the front, you have the transverse abdominis, the rectus abdominis, the obliques. The side also is the obliques together. The back, you have the paraspinals and some other deeper muscles of the glutes and the QL. All together, they encircle the, the spine in kind of like a soup can with the spine being in the middle. And if you have really good core control and core strength and you have proper technique, you can optimally handle forces landing or backbending because you're bracing your core and buffering those forces, right? If you have someone who doesn't understand how to brace and breathe properly or someone who really doesn't have um, proper core, deep core control, or maybe has some issues in their pelvic floor, you can have some problems where it's an overextended posture in a gymnast. And instead of the force going down equally and bracing everywhere, when they land, the force goes out the front and they arch their back and they buckle and it causes some pain and a compression based issue, right? So it's very important that somebody understands that core control of how to position their ribs on top of their pelvic in a good position and neutral and doesn't arch or doesn't hollow too much and put again if you hollow and round the force could go backwards and cause some pressure on the back the lower back area from a rounding point of view so all these muscles are really really important to think about again diaphragm on top pelvic flow in the bottom transverse in the front uh rectus abdominis um, the back you have the the paraspinals on the side you have the obliques and the ql it's important for us to understand how much these forces buffer are, are buffered by these larger muscles, right? 
the the fishing pole analogy comes from that fishing pole of the spine plus the la- the ligaments and the guide wires are not enough to handle force. If you put a small amount of force in them, as research has shown, the, the spine will buckle if you remove all the muscles right without it. It's only because of the multifidi, the transversalities, the deeper muscles, and the superficial muscles, the diaphragm, the core, the transverse, the obliques. It's only because of all of those muscles that you can produce force, absorb force, and transfer force between your arms and your legs for gymnastic skills. And the reason I belabor this point is because it's crucial that we understand what types of forces cause irritation to certain areas in your lower back so that we can deload those temporarily. But also we need to be training right away, proper neutral alignment versus hollow versus arch in gymnastics, and then be able to teach that athlete, okay, how do I find neutral under high force? How do I find a braced extension, tight core, my whole body works, but I use my shoulders and my hips when I backbend. How do I find a nice landing position of, of neutral core in a proper squat position with bracing and breathing that then uses my legs into a squat? That is the hallmark of a lot of rehab. It's really great exercise programs, right? I use a lot of things for rehab, but exercise progressions and workload management is is the absolute cornerstone key of all rehab I do for lower back, everything, right? So we have to understand the, how these muscles work. We have to understand how we're going to train them. And then with that said, we can't neglect certain areas, right? A really great analogy that my boss and mentor, Mike Reinald, taught me is think about a camping tent, right? You put a camping tent out with equal pressure on all four poles and on the middle. If you don't have one of those guide wires into the ground, your tent is going to collapse sideways and not be really resistant to forces. A very similar phenomenon analogy is what I use with gymnasts, right? If we set a tent up, right, your core being the tent, and we only train the six pack with leg lifts and rope climbs and hollow rocks, and we only train uh, the lower back with arch ups, right? But we neglect the core with uh, the lateral core with anti-rotation work or with side plank work. We neglect breathing patterns. We neglect pelvic floor, which is not my specialty, but I refer people to, right? We neglect bracing and compression load with farmer carries or sled work, right? We're going to have one guide wire of the tent that's not strong enough, and it's going to cause somebody to not perform well because they can't bounce and do plyometrics for tumbling and vaulting. They can't brace and tap the bar harder for releases, but also they're vulnerable to, to something going wrong because they might have a area of their core that's underdeveloped, or they might not know how to brace that core with good core control. And that can cause the issue where the the high force goes through them and it causes an issue. Okay. So it's, it's in review here. Okay. Bones, discs, ligaments, right. All working together. And then on top of that, deeper, deeper subsystem, more reflexive activation, multifidi, right. Transversalities, um, not really under conscious control, but we do that with proper breathing, proper bracing, proper strength conditioning patterns, putting load on us and doing really good technique in gymnastics, and then learning how to be stiff and brace then larger muscles, much, much bigger, more robust span, multiple joints, uh, rectus abdominis, lower back, paraspinals, QL, um, obliques, internal, external, and then also involving the glutes, the hips, the thoracic spine as well. Those all make up the core together. Okay. Visioning a soup can around the, uh, lower back that can handle those forces. So that is really as deep as I want to go in the hardcore anatomy. The other thing I want to mention, because it's important is that inside of these levels, as you can see, and I'll put this close, you can see that there are nerves that come out between each level. Okay. So this is what you might hear is like the L5, uh, nerve or the L4, L5, S1 nerve. What it means when someone says L5, S1 nerve is that it's the nerve between maybe L5 or L4 and L5 that comes out at that level. Okay. So you can see here that this nerve kind of exits right here, right? So if I open the up this way, you can see the spinal cords in the middle, which is that this guy right here. And then these nerve branches come off at each level. Okay. So right here. And so you can see as it relates to it is again, I don't want to make the pain science world angry, but as I move forward, right, you can see how the disc tends to move backwards and that can sometimes put pressure on the nerve root, right? That's what somebody might have a disc herniation, um, that causes, uh, some of the gel to come outside and it presses on the nerve root and causes some sciatica, right? So you might have some tissue irritation, right? Pain science world would say you have uh, tissue sensitivity and you have a high nociceptive drive from peripheral sensitization and that that is causing some pain tag neuro to be put out. I believe that stuff's so hardcore and I'm a fan of it, but in the, in the model of explaining to the, the average person, I think sometimes explaining how rounding 
right, can cause some irritation, particularly under 40 times body weight when you land on forces, can cause some of that migration of the disc to put pressure on the, the nerve root. It might be why somebody has sciatica, right, or why somebody has some really intense flexion-based lower back pain where they can't sit in school, they can't round, they can't do kips, right? Typically, that might come from either a creep phenomenon where we sit for a long time and then cause some irritation or the disc migrating backwards and causing some irritation on the soft tissue. Maybe as you move forward or you back bend, you strain the joint capsule and that becomes some of the issue as well. It's hard to differentiate whether it's, you know, disc versus nerve versus joint capsule versus muscle, unless you have a really sensitive test, like something for sciatica, but just keep in mind that these nerve roots go down to different areas of the body, back, the leg, front of leg. So we have these nerve structures that intervene or sorry, that innervate the disc and, can, and can, can supply there, but also they get signals coming back to them. So signals coming out and signals coming in, come in through these nerve roots, these ganglion, and then go up to the brain, okay? So that's as deep as I want to go in the anatomy because I think people are going to shut the podcast off if I go any more hardcore geek mode that I already am. But this is a really good model to help out. Hopefully that explains it a little bit, and then we'll talk about injuries and how this relates, okay? So the way to go about this, let me just take a quick sip of water. Okay, the best way to go about this that I have found using all the different areas of the research that I find very useful is kind of going in more of a systems-based approach, but also more of a um, category, right? Categories of back pain are probably going to be the most um, beneficial for us to follow. So like I said, I think that there are really good, useful overlaps between the pain science world and the mechanical world, uh, typically based on the person in front of me, if they are more super high level athlete, they read a lot about strength and conditioning, biomechanics, they want to know all the things about anatomy and geeky things, I go I lean more on the mechanical side. Somebody comes in terrified of their back pain, maybe more general population, they don't want to look at their their imaging, they're terrified. I won't mention any of that, I'll go way down the pain science route, talk about analogies, talk about pain neurotax, talk about sensitivity, because they seem the person who's a little bit more on edge about their lower back. So I'll talk about some useful analogies that I've learned from uh, Adrian Lau and other people in the acute section. But for the sake of this, right, we want to kind of think about the different movements of forces and how that's going to relate to injury. Okay. So let's talk, let's start with the most common one, which is backwards, right? So with backwards motions, right, or forwards motions, there's different stresses front to back. The forces that we are going to have to look through and evaluate are going to be backwards or extension, okay, forwards or flexion, right? And then also rotation or side bending, side gliding, you could you could say the McKenzie system uses side gliding, and then compression and traction, okay? Now with forward and backwards bending, you can have backwards bending with rotation, you can also have forward bending with rotation, okay? And so what this means is that different areas of the spine are more prone to have injuries or get stressed based on what they do. If a gymnast has a very back bending profile, right, very heavy dominant back bending, back walk over, front walk over, back handspring on beam, back handspring layout, step out, Yurchenko, uh, Maloney, Shapash, um, all the things that are back bending, right? If they have a lot of back bending in their profile, they're more prone to backwards based categorization of pain. Vice versa, slightly more powerful athlete, right? Maybe does a back tuck on beam, maybe does double back on floor, does a sucre Yurchenko, does a heavy bar dismount with flex based landing, they might be more prone to flexion based issues. Sometimes it's traction. Sometimes it's hanging on rings and swinging on rings. It's high taps for Chinese taps or dismounts that bothers somebody. Sometimes it's compression of the landings of men's gymnastics or the landings of trampoline and tumbling or the landings of different stuff and, and all the dismounts that causes compression-based pain with maybe compression or flexion together. So let's talk about back bending first, okay? There's three main things injury-wise that happen in back pain. There's more than this, but let's just go with this. Number one, with straight extension, just straight back bending, you can cause impingement between the top bone and the bottom bone here. This is called spinous process impingement. So you can back bend here and have spinous process impingement. There can be a bone bruise between these two. Now, I'm not going to go through the test. We'll talk about that in a second, just to, in the sake of not confusing people. So back bending can have an occasion where these two bones bump together. Now, these joints on the side here, right? These two joints I talked about, the facet joints on each side, you can also have irritation of one side, right? So say if someone has a backwards with rotation, right? That can stress the facet joint here, okay? And we talked about this a little bit. The starting point of most gymnast back pain is facet syndrome. So facet syndrome is when, whether from backbending or from turning or from landing or twisting or a lot of backbending, one side 
gets really painful, right? And you could argue it's the joint capsule. You could argue it's the muscles around the joint capsule. You've strained a multifidi. But that's like the deep ache that people feel when they're being, their back starts to hurt. It's usually something coming from these joints being cranky and irritable, okay? I'll be honest. A lot of gymnasts don't seek out medical services when they have baseline levels of pain like that. They think it's normal. They brush it off. They try to train through it. But it's usually a combination of the facet being irritated, the muscles around it being irritated, or if you're in the pain science world, uh, high tissue sensitivity with high nociceptive drive due to a repetitive movement of backwards bending and compression. Okay. So that being said, the progression of this is if, like I said, if this joint continues to get a lot of back bending, someone keeps training, they do high compression forces, they're not landing properly, they're not doing respective workloads. The next progression of this can be what's called a stress reaction. Okay. So a stress reaction is where, like I said, the bone, the pars up here, right, or down here, depending on the level you're working with, the pars itself starts to start to get uh, increased signaling and it starts to become inflamed. So there's bony inflammation and you can sometimes see a hairline fracture through or a hairline starting to go through there, right? That can be causing the, the stress reaction of the pars inticularis, right? Or the neural arch as well. So with that said, that's the second kind of degree of extension-based back pain that's on one side usually is a stress reaction, okay? So if somebody gets imaging done and they get it right away, they might catch it, right? This person might be in a brace for four to six weeks to present them from bending backwards. If you live on the West Coast, they might not use a brace at all. Um, controversy there in the literature, but it's usually a little bit easier to deal with because it just takes time for the stress reaction to calm down. You can let the back heal. You can slowly go through the rehab process. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. If they continue to backbend, continue to train, continue to ignore their pain, don't get it looked at. Maybe they get an MRI that doesn't have a heavy enough T3 weight and it doesn't pick up their imaging issue. They can actually fracture. So this is spondylolysis. Okay. So what this is, it's sometimes called the Scotty dog uh, with a collar fracture because on x-ray, it looks like a Scotty dog with a little collar around his neck. But essentially you have fractured the bone of that pars, which is right here. Okay, so this fracture then because of the repetitive extension and the sliding going on of this first one relative to the second one causes that fracture to actually happen through. And again, I can show you in this model because this is a stress fracture here. So in this model right here in a stress fracture, you can see that if I keep backbending, right, this would slide forward and you see that fracture start to pop up right there, right, right here, right? So as it slides, you can see how now as I backbend, right? It's going to start moving forward relative to the other disc because we now have a fracture in that sp spotty dog collar. It's a little tough with the lighting, but yeah, you can see it. Okay. So that is a stress fracture. That is a full fracture of the bone. That is a spondylolysis. Okay. And again, from repetitive extension and rotation and possibly compression. Okay. That's on one side. The last progression of this, sorry, first, this person is, is probably going to be braced where I live in Boston. It's the, the Boston overlap brace. So it's more prone to be braced, but usually you're in a brace for three months because you need to stabilize that fracture and prevent it. There's research debating of whether it's actually stabilizing the fracture. It might be moving. It might be more symptom management that somebody um, is just not moving their back and irritating the muscles or the bones, not rubbing around each other. Um, but they'll probably be in a brace. They go through a rehab process. It's usually uh, three months in the brace and then another three months of rehab and getting them stronger again and then return to sport program. In my opinion, it usually takes about six to eight months to do it properly. Um, sometimes less if you have a stress reaction. Obviously, it might be three to four months in total. So that syndrome might just be four to six weeks. We'll talk about later. But that is the uh, continuation pathology of those two things. So stress, uh, facet syndrome, stress reaction, spondylolysis, spondylolithesis. Okay, the other thing that can happen in here is you can have extension-based pain and particularly compression-based pain. So if I extend a lot and I compress down, you can have both joints become irritated. So both sides of the facet become irritated. I personally find that just straight extension is spinous process impingement, whereas extension and rotation to one side is uh, back walkovers, back handsprings with one leg moving is more uh, stork based pathology testing is positive and they have pars on one side. I find that compression with extension together is usually both sides of the pars, so bilateral pars defects. You can have someone who lands really heavy and arches so much and lands in a big extension posture like I talked about in that study where both facets become irritated. You can have progressions of that, right? You can have bilateral facet irritation, which is really, really stiff in your back and it's really, really sore. It can progress to a pars fracture in the same way as one does where both sides of the lower back become uh, fractured and it's a little bit more of a pain in the butt, no pun intended, but it's really, really hard because both sides are fractured and you have to rest a little bit longer 
typically more pain comes along with that. So the research shows us that long-term outcomes are decent for people with stress reactions, uh, debatable whether they heal all the time, uh, not in union versus union fractures. And sometimes there's fibrocartilage that fills in that gap. Um, but less favorable long-term outcomes are people with bilateral PARS defects, people who have spondylolysis that's more sliding forward than one or two uh, grades. So 50% or more of the disc is sliding forward or the vertebral body is sliding forward relative to the one below it. And then also any neural involvement also um, is problematic. And so that can happen sometimes. I want to mention that is that you can sometimes have so much arching in your lower back that it causes some irritation of those nerves that come out. Or you can, you can jar your nerve when you land really, really heavy because you might cause some irritation there. So in the more extreme cases, there are times where there's so much arching going on and so much concern for the fracture sliding that it does start to cause numbness, tingling, and traveling pain. That's obviously the more extreme of the bell curve, but it is possible to have arching and extension and compression-based pain together that causes the nerve to be irritable. So I wanted to mention that because there are some people with nerve-based symptoms that I deal with. So that is that are the main categories of backwards-based pain. Okay, We're going to test for that with backwards-based screening and backward-based algorithm that I'll talk about next. Opposite of that is forward based issues, right? So forward being straight forward this way rounding, right? This is typically going to be starting out as more muscular and ligament irritation, possibly the multifidi. If you look at Stuart McGill's work, or if you're in the pain science world, it could just be repetitive rounding causes a sensitization of the soft tissue structures, which causes a very high intensity pain output to protect you against rounding more and stressing these structures. Okay. You get a lot of uh, sensitive, uh, uh, local peripheral sensitization. So what happens here, like I said, is the nerves are inside these here, the muscles go up and down. But as I round my back a lot more, if I land with heavy compression forces, you can see how this puts pressure backwards, right? It might put pressures on the muscles that are here, like the lower back paraspinals, the multifidi between these ligaments, or sorry, between these bones with ligaments next to it. But also you might overstretch the joint capsule as it stretches out more and more and more. So typically what I see is the beginning part of this with in bars, with landing, with rounding, double flipping skills, landing in a flex spine, is it's usually a combination of just muscular irritation, maybe the multifidi, paraspinal, QL maybe is strained, maybe you irritate the joint capsule, and it's the same kind of idea. Whereas that person gets stiffness, soreness, they maybe have a week or so of pain, but they deload themselves, they maybe don't speak about it, and it just, they continue with life, they get a strain, life goes on, it's okay, nobody dies. Right, if things progress, they don't fix their landing technique. They have really high workloads. They don't have great strength conditioning programs. They don't land properly. Their ankle flexibility is not great. They can't absorb the forces. You can have a progression of this where the disc actually starts to press back so much, it can irritate the nerve. And it can also irritate, like I said, you can start to strain the muscles that are much more involved. You can cause more crankiness to the ligaments back here and also maybe cause some very irritable tissues to become highly, highly sensitized. This is typically where people come to see you. They typically have really, really aggressive pain levels when they sit, when they bend forward, when they try to shut, tie their shoes, they can't even do a pike stretch. They have a lot of pain in their lower back, or they might start to have traveling pain a little bit into their hips, right? So we have localized back pain, and you can also sometimes have traveling back pain, which is called uh, peripheralization, my fault, space out there. Okay, you can have a peripheral symptom that goes down your leg right? Like sciatica or different nerve roots and stuff like that. Versus if someone just has back pain, or if we find something that alleviates their back pain, they got centralized back pain where it just kind of comes back up. There's no sciatic symptoms in their leg. A lot of this stuff comes from the Kenzie system, which I think is really, really valuable here. So backwards and forwards. So this is usually what happens is they keep rounding more and more. It can cause, you know, irritation of the actual wall here, the annular wall. If somebody has a disc that you know, is intact. This annular wall is intact from the top. It's usually just referred to as a, a bulge or uh, a mild herniation. If you look at the research, actually, a lot of herniations get better on their own. So don't always look at the MRI and freak out. But if someone has an MRI that gets so intense because they have so much pressure that it causes some uh, uh, disc material to go through the annular wall, and it's now outside the disc joint in here, that can be a problem because now what can happen is that the disc can move outside this, this containment. It's no longer a closed system, but also the nerve itself can start to get pressure and that disc might be escaped outside of the disc wall. It's called an excursion. And that's a little bit more problematic because that might be someone who needs to get that cleaned up or get like a surgery, like a microdisectomy, because they could have foot drop. They could have raging sciatica pain. They could have really, really scary nerve root symptoms. That's like a whole different uh, kind of concern for red flags. So most people don't have that intensity um, until they're older or if they have a lot of high level skills, but you can have the disc move back. It can cause some irritation on the muscles or the, the motion itself might just be sensitive. 
And that could be something that you want to deal with, right? And so the, the reason I bring these up first is because if somebody has extension-based back pain, we're going to want to treat them with getting them out of extension with neutral and flexion-based positions that make them feel better. If somebody has flexion-based pain or flexion and rotation-based pain, we're going to want to treat them with getting them out of rounding and more neutral and then backbending, right? And so it's worth noting here that you have the extension plus rotation, which could be the one-sided of the pars could be irritation you can have flexion and rotation away so back forward bending and rotating away can cause a one-sided disc bulge or a disc irritation or a low back quadrant irritation whereas rounding and compression together can cause symptoms on both sides so that's what i mean with extension versus extension with rotation or flexion versus flexion with rotation right you're going to try to rule somebody into that category with what motions hurt what skills hurt what skills don't hurt what things make you feel better Typically, the person with back bending type pain doesn't like laying on their stomach. They don't like bending backwards. They don't like being in an upright posture. And it feels better to sit or round or kind of lean forward. The person with flexion based back pain or rotation based back pain and flexion caused by that doesn't feel awesome with sitting in a chair, doing a pike stretch, leaning forward, sitting for a long time, then getting up because the creep phenomenon kind of has some irritation there. They feel better with being upright, laying on their stomach kind of arching your back a little bit, which is how we're going to treat somebody in the acute phase. Okay. And so those are the big ones is forward and backwards. I do want to mention, sorry, forwards, backwards, and then rotation. Obviously, like I said, I do want to mention impact and traction because those are also important as well. So for compression based back pain, right, you can obviously see how I said, when you land really heavy, just the motion of this downward pressure can cause the joints to be irritated. It can also cause some of these structures like the multifidi and some of the ligaments to be irritated. So really, really heavy landings can do that themselves. But typically, really heavy compression forces come with one or the other backwards or forward. So it's either compression and forward base flexion, which causes that irritation and stretching like I talked about, or it's extension and compression together. So back bending and extending and landing, right, causes the joints to become irritated. So I mentioned that because they come together coupled, but usually the primary mechanism causing their pain is compression. So landings, dismounts, heavy, heavy impacts versus the extreme backbending motion, right, might be causing a different category of pain. And I see this often that sometimes people don't break this up into either just straight extension or extension with rotation or extension with compression. And they have huge headaches with why they can't get back to gym because they don't realize that the compression is the issue more so. Let's pause on that and slowly get back to other things versus the, the extension is the issue. Let's slowly get back to those skills and we can go into dismounts and impact more. That's how I make return to support programs be a little bit more differentiated. All right. And then lastly, traction forces. So picture somebody hanging and it's pulling from top to bottom. And here we have these fibers called Sharpie's fibers, which Stu McGill has taught me about, which are essentially uh, connection points of the disc to the actual uh, end plate or growth plate in here as well. And that can cause some irritation. Sometimes under high traction forces, it can be pulling on the fibers that attach right here between the disc and between the growth plate. And that can be irritation. You can also argue that traction forces will pull on the joint capsule if it's a really relaxed core position, or that it might be straining some of the ligaments and muscles between these vertebral bodies. Okay. So the big ones are forward bending, backward bending, um, and rotation, then impact, then traction. That's the order in which I see the most extension based first, then flexion, then um, compression, and then traction forces. Right. So obviously extension, flexion, having a rotational pieces. So those are kind of the main categories of those things, backwards, forwards, um, rotation, impact, compression. So the next question comes up is how do we test for these things? How do we rule somebody into this category? Take quick water. Number one is listening to the person, having a really good in-depth subjective history about what causes their pain, what skills are worse with extension. They'll say it's back walkovers, front walkovers, back handsprings, uh, running and sprinting when I'm upright, arching onto the table. A person with forward base pain will say it's um, landing, rounding, pulling into a flip, trying to do a tuck roll, front tuck, back tuck, um, all of those kind of things. Compression will say dismounts hurt, the impact of tumbling hurts, the landing of tumbling hurts, uh, landing my vault hurts, hitting the trampoline hurts, hitting the uh, the actual rod floor hurts when I, I try to take off. Whereas traction people will say it's the uh, swinging, it's the hanging, it's the long traction forces that bug me. So with that in mind, you listen to the person's story and you try to rule it into your mind. Okay, what's going to be the thing I have to try to rule in or rule out? Because that's going to help me teach them how to not do those motions, but also the opposite of that will probably be what we treat them with based on the like SFMA or the McKenzie system or the McGill and kind of like pain world to get a pain science world together of, of David Butler and such. So I have developed my own little algorithm here for treating people. 
a series of tests that I put somebody through to try to understand what is causing their pain and what I'm going to do to try to help them get out of pain, okay? And so this is really a combination of many, many things that I have learned. It's a lot of different people who I've studied from, and I would like to make this a little bit easier. I will pull up this uh, slideshow to make these uh, be shown on um, pictures rather than just me talking about them. So what I try to do is I try to think about in my mind the test that I'm using. I have standing tests or the most impact-based tests or the most gravity-based tests. So forward bending, backward bending, jumping and landing. I have this top tier of tests that I use to say which of these motions is more sensitive and which ones feel better. From there, there's a second level of testing that I do, which is mimicking the motions, but with less gravity. Okay. And so what it tells me is one, does it further rule in this person is, is painful? And two, how sensitive is this person? Do I need to send this person for possible imaging? Because I'm worried they have a stress fracture. We, we work in an outpatient uh, out of network clinic. So I see people directly all the time with back pain. Or am I thinking this is maybe not as intense? There's not as many red flags in terms of worrisome for a fracture or disc pathology, uh, sciatica based traveling pain. We don't need to send one to a physician first. And then the third layer is the least amount of gravity, mostly hands on tests that are mostly special tests that I really confirm myself okay, this is the motion that stinks. This is the motion that feels better, okay? So let's start with extension first, again, going from standing to uh, less gravity to least gravity possible. And I will share my screen. Okay, and so this comes from the, um, I have a full medical course online for medical providers to learn everything I do for back pain and shoulder pain or whatever, but this comes from the slides from this deck. So the first one we do here, so this is the, what I call the cluster test for extension intolerant. We're trying to figure out, does someone not feel great with back bending? The first thing I will do is a standing extension. So I'll just stand, bend backwards for my hands on your hips. Tell me if that hurts your back. Okay, and then a stork test is uh, extension plus rotation. So they stand on one leg, they turn and rotate and try to say, I say, touch your hand to the opposite knee, the back of your just the same sided knee. So left hand to the back of your left knee. And we try to see if it has pain on one side of their lower back, right side pain of their lower back. Okay. Then we will do a press up test. They'll lay on their stomach and do a seal stretch like you see in this picture here to see, does this hurt your back? And then we'll do what's called the PA shearing test, which is where you put your hand on one hip, your opposite thumb on the other um, area of the pars, and you pull back with your left hand and push forward with your right hand. And you're trying to mimic PA shearing on the pars and ticularis or the facet joint. Okay. So starting from standing, back bending, and then storks on both sides, and then press up test, and then a PA shearing. Again, we're looking at extension as well as extension and rotation here. So what I'm trying to do here is say, does someone have the the spinous process impingement of these things on backbending? Do they have one-sided PARS-based, facet-based symptoms, or do they have bilateral-based, PARS-based symptoms? And I try to do all these tests. If someone goes all the way through and has a lot of discomfort and their, their story matches that they've had long-standing pain, four to six weeks, they're not feeling great, they're not getting better with resting, I might send them for imaging to see if they have an acute stress reaction or a stress fracture. Okay. If not, if they're not too bad, we might treat them with just like conservative management for four to six weeks, try exercise, try some progressive work to make them feel better and then get them back and see how that feels. All right. So for the flexion intolerance, okay. The thing that we're going to do here is we're trying to do the opposite motions, right? So first we will stand and do a toe touch round your back, touch your toes. Tell me how that feels. Okay. And then we will also do um, a uh, knee hug test on their back as well. So I'll, I'll cross their, or I'll hug their knees up into their chest. And then the second thing that I usually do, not pictured here or not shown here, is a quadruped rock back. So hands and knees, rock your hips back to your feet. If that rounding of your lower back bugs you, um, let me know how that feels. So standing, flexion, touch your toes, hands and knees, rock back. That's the second layer. Third is a slump test, which is what you see here, a special test. Round your back. I'll lift your head up and see if we have any flexion intolerance, maybe sciatica symptoms. You could also do like a cross straight leg raise or something like that to see if they have discogenic pathology. But again, I'm starting from the top and seeing, okay, if I round you, does it bother your back, your nerves, the disc? Do you not like that motion? Okay. And we also do a seated compression test on the compression side to also rule inflection based pain. But that's the forward based bending, right? I could do forward toe touch, reach across your body to the opposite leg to do if I'm suspecting one leg or one area is more painful, round your back in a slump, cross your legs or sorry, hug your knees to your chest on your back, see if that bugs you constantly just ruling in 
Does this person have rounding based problems? I go through that entire algorithm to rule in or rule out if somebody has that problem. Okay. And then next, as we talk about some of the issues with um, rotation intolerance, most of the things I just said are going to come up alongside those, right? So flexion and rotation or a side glide and standing extension and rotation, which is a stork, right? A knee hug across the opposite chest or on your stomach, go up on your elbows, put one hand behind your back, extend and rotate together. Like you see uh, Jan here doing with me doing a special test. Again, just trying to further rule in, is it rotation and one side that bugs you or flexion and rotation towards one side that bugs you. And I'm doing the same thing. So that's flexion, that's extension. Rotation would be stork standing, reach across, touch your opposite leg side glides and standing, right? Do a, a prone on elbows, extension and rotation test or on their back. I would have them uh, hug their knee and go across their body or do maybe do a hands and knees quadruped rock to see if flexing and rotating bugs their back. I would do the same exact thing to rule in rotation and flexion intolerance. Okay. So compression intolerance, right? Is going to be uh, trying to impact the force down, right? So, so straight down their body. So first we would do what's uh, just jumping and landing, just jump up and down and land and see how that feels, right? We would next do a heel drop test. So push up on the balls, your te on your toes, drop down really hard and kind of jar your back and get some shock through your heels and see if that sends some impact up your body. Stuart McGill taught me that one. Okay. And then next we do a seated compression test. So they sit on the corner. As you see here, they arch their back as much as they can. They grab the table and they pull down and that is extension and compression forces together okay the other way you can do it to test for flexion and compression is they round their back grab the table pull down that is flexing and compressing the disc as well and all the soft tissue as well see if that makes them be painful you can even sit up nice and tall upright and then have somebody actually core brace and say tighten your abs tighten your core and then pull down again if their symptoms get better you know that that person might need some education on core bracing and that neutral will make them feel better but that is going to be the main algorithm i use for that if you're thinking about SIJ, I don't do a ton of SIJ stuff, to be honest, but you could do some shearing testing, some compression testing. I tend to find it's more the actual lumbar spine is problematic, but you can do that if you think SI joint is suspected in someone who's really lax or overextended or has trauma where they hit their, their sacrum on the ground, something like that. Those are times when I do use it. Um, but then you can kind of go through and see if someone has those test positive. That would be the compression intolerance. I'd be ruling it if someone's compression in, uh, sensitive or compression intolerant. And then lastly, traction intolerance, right? They're going to tell you that hanging feels pretty crappy. The three things we would do, I would have you hang, right? I would just have someone hang from a high bar or from a pull-up bar and see if that bugs them. The other test that is really, really good here is a prone spondy test. So you have someone lay on their stomach, you grab their calves, you bend their knees up, and you pull down into traction and then extend their back up off the table and see if that traction and extension mimics the same type of force they feel at the bottom of a ring swing, the bottom of a Chinese tap, the bottom of the ring giant, something like that. So that would be um, traction intolerant, right? You would go all the way down that algorithm there. So those are really the main ways that I look into these things. You may have noticed that I haven't talked about um, scoliosis yet. The reason being is that a lot of that comes from Cobb angles and imaging and stuff like that. That is really not my area of expertise. It's more for a spinal um, specialist to do. So if somebody has spondy, uh, sorry, somebody has um, scoliosis, they'll probably be getting looked at with Cobb angles, x-rays, serial bracing and stuff like that. I have treated people through serial bracing, but there's this method called the Schroff method, which I'm not super expert at yet. I'm still trying to learn my way through it. I oftentimes, if someone has a really extreme scoliosis, I will send them to a Schroff specialist because it's a little bit more advanced and nuanced and it's something I'm not super familiar with. Likewise, how if somebody has pelvic floor issues, I'm typically referring to a women's health specialist because it's a very specialized area. So I know my lanes, I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not good at, but I do treat people for um, low-grade scoliosis when symptom-wise, and then if somebody has really extreme uh, surgery, like a, uh, fusion surgeries, I'll treat somebody after that, but the actual management of scoliosis under like a 40 degree or 30 degree Cobb angle, I'll probably send to a specialist first before I, I try to help them out a little bit. So, all right, that being said, that's the testing, right? So we have the anatomy, we have the categories, we have the testing. Um, let me just pull my notes back down. There we go. So with that being said, right, we understand how these things can be irritable, right? Maybe we have the facet joints with backwards, maybe we have compression and forwards in the disc, we could have the end plate or Sharpies fibers and growth plates in the compression. Um, a lot of those things can be coming up, but we now have ruled somebody in for an evaluation. Let's think about treatment, right? Let's think about what do we actually do to help somebody? And the first thing I always start with here is understanding the four phases of rehab and some realistic timelines here. Okay. There's four phases of rehab that I explained to everybody with back pain. The first phase when you have an injury is just 
damage control, putting the fire out, calming your body down, right? Getting the sensitivity low. From the very, very beginning, it's probably, based on the injury, they can range from two weeks to six weeks. Two weeks for very mild strains, very low-level irritation, very, very just acute uh, back strains. Six weeks, maybe if someone who has a stress fracture and is in a brace, right? Because it takes so long. Someone who has a really intense sciatica with discogenic pain, it could take up to six weeks of workload modification and exercise and um, treatment strategies to make you feel better. That's the first phase. The second phase, again, could be two to six weeks, depending on the injury, is usually just being a normal human again. So can you walk up and down stairs? Can you sleep? Can you sit in school? Can you carry your book bag? Can you feel comfortable on a long walk when you walk around town or go through cities and through go through school? Just be normal again, sleep comfortably, walk comfortably. That can take, again, anywhere from two to six weeks, depending on mild strain to full-on irritation, stress fracture, really high-level um, fractures or, or, or disc issues. That second phase, again, is just be a normal human. The third phase is usually two to six weeks. Um, so you're at the six week to four and a half month mark. And that is be a general athlete again. So many people skip this in low back pain, but this is just be generally athletic again. Can you squat? Can you hinge? Can you split pelvis? Can you step up? Can you do core work, advanced work? Can you handle anti-flexion and anti-extension, anti-side bending, compression, uh, farmer carry, sled carry, jump, land, run, right? All the things general athletes should be able to do. Can you do those things, right? That's the next phase. Then lastly is be a gymnast again, right? Can you do leg lifts? Can you do rope climbs? Can you do bounding, tumbling, and plyometric drills? Can you do in-bar work? Can you do drills? Um, that's when you slowly get that return to sport plan that I talked about where we're looking through different surfaces and different numbers and stuff like that. So you slowly expose somebody. All in all, right, you look at the big picture there, a very mild strain or a very mild irritation could, could only take six to eight weeks to get better, right? You could, you could get better in a week, feel okay in another week and then be back in two weeks, right? Some I've seen people literally, they oftentimes don't see me, but I hear about this is like, yeah, I tweaked my back, took a couple of days off, felt better. Next week, got back into it, was doing okay. got my skills back and then I competed three weeks later. Totally fine, right? Um, other people, really extreme side of the spectrum is they have a full stress fracture, a very uh, aggressive sciatica with uh, sciatica symptoms and, and a disc herniation. They have to get a micro discectomy and it takes them up to five months to get better because they need to go through all those phases, right? Uh, sometimes I'll just say it straight out. I do believe that the pain science world is important here and that we don't want to scare someone into looking at their imaging and say, you know, oh my God, I can't believe your back looks like that. Uh, particularly in the back, there's many changes that are normal with high level athletes. And I'm oftentimes downplaying exactly what they say and say, oh, you know, yeah, that, that's common for someone to see, but you know, that's also present in people who don't have pain. So we don't want to be, you know, super worried here. We just want to be aware of it and figure out why your symptoms are coming on, what motions feel sensitive, what motions feel better. Let's do an exercise program to try to get you out of that education and you'll be okay. There's two analogies that I really, really like with um, the pain science world that I use quite a bit and it, and it works here for the uh, the timelines and the acute management. Okay, one analogy that I really, really like from Adrian Lau is this analogy of you know a, an alarm system at your house. And I think young athletes and I also think people who are scared with back pain, if I was someone who was not educated and had a consumer mentality, I'd be a little bit nervous too about my back. But one thing that I really like to tell them is, you know, your brain has this system for protecting you. And so pain is actually an output of the brain to, to keep you safe. If we didn't have pain, we could have some bad things happen. Imagine if you didn't have pain, you were walking along the beach, you stepped in a piece of glass and you didn't notice it because you had no pain. And then you walk, you know, four, four or five minutes on the road and you pass out because of blood loss. You look behind you, there's blood all the way down the, the beach because there was no pain to protect you. So pain is, is oftentimes thought about as something that's bad, but it's very important we educate people that, you know, it's a good thing to have because it alerts you of, of possible danger. And we don't want to freak out and say, you know, oh my God, everything's the worst thing ever. You're, gonna, you're never going to do gymnastics. Like you don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you want to be realistic with someone and say, hey, listen, you know, your brain is trying to tell you that something is going on here we need to work on. And if, if we don't take care of it, we, we could have some problems. We could have some irritation where you, you keep getting worse. You don't get to do the things you love. So our goal is to use this pain as a signal and figure out what we can do to lower this, this threshold of sensitivity, right? And so the alarm system is really, really helpful because you tell people that, hey, you know, in a, in a normal situation, your body has an alarm system to alert you to things that are not so great and that we wanna make sure that you're, you're aware of, right? So with that being said, when you have an alarm system going off in your house, the alarm system is, is set to a certain, certain threshold of burglars trying to steal your stuff. So when somebody breaks into your house or when something goes wrong, it doesn't meet the, the normal pattern, your brain 
or your, your alarm system goes off to alert somebody that something's, something's wrong. So in this situation, what that analogy compares to is that in a normal situation without any sensitivity, without any, any, any uh, input of, of danger from your, from your body and nervousness, um, you have a high level, high threshold for force and for skills, right? You can do gymnastics, you can run, you can tumble, you can do all this kind of stuff. Your back feels great. But what happened here is because of something sensitivity wise, it lowered the threshold of that alarm. So now we have things that normally wouldn't set your alarm off are now creating uh, the alarm to kind of go off and, and produce pain as an output. So in the analogy of the house, now, instead of a burglar causing the alarm to go off, the mailman coming to drop off your mail or leafs blowing by your house is triggering the alarm and it doesn't make sense, right? That's not a threat. That's not something that would be dangerous. But for some reason, right, because of that lowered sensitivity or lowered threshold, those things are causing the alarm to go off. And that's what happened. That's what's happening right now. Because of the the sensitivity, because of this this awkward landing, because of the the time that you have continued backbending going on, your brain is really protecting you. And we need to find a way to reduce the stress on that area to reduce the sensitivity that will lower you know lower the the, the gating there, and then that will also with exercise with slow exposure back to the things you want to do will reset the alarm and will kind of convince your brain that like hey things are okay here, my body's healing, my body's strong, I can handle this. But it's all about playing with exercise and workloads to rebuild that tolerance to uh, to, to capacity to force. And that's what good strength conditioning is. That's what good exercise programs are. Help someone get out of that acute phase with educating them on what's causing their pain and what's going to make their pain feel better. If backbending doesn't feel awesome, let's try to avoid laying on our stomach, avoid backbending for a while. If sitting and rounding doesn't feel awesome, let's try to get out of that position, sit on a nice comfortable cushion with a towel support, be upright, go for walks, try to do more neutral based stuff, get away from those skills that involve rounding. That set that helps reduce the sensitivity of the alarm initially, along with maybe some hands-on work and some some breathing exercises or some some education. Then we slowly rebuild their tolerance to that with strength conditioning, and then finally the return to sport program. So, I love that analogy of the the alarm system because it helps educate people about sensitivity, and it reframes pain as something that's not terrible, but it's something that's there to protect you. The other analogy that's really good, which people sometimes can't make sense of why their back hurts so bad and why they constantly can't do things they want to do, is uh, the CEO of a, a company. So. A uh, really, really big company. Your body represents a really big company. Your brain's the CEO. It has lots of different departments that it has to kind of make sure are running well in order for your body to work, right? In a big company, the marketing department has to go great. The finance has to go great. The actual production has to go great. All these different areas have to be working really, really well in order for things to keep going. In your body, it's the same system, right? You have your lower back area has to be working well. Your heart and lungs has to be working well. Your legs have to be working well. If something happens in that department where something kind of starts to go awry, there might be some some worry or some concern, maybe from the finance department that, uh, uh oh, we messed up something here or something's something's really uh, we made a mistake or something happened here where people are arguing with each other. And what happens is the CEO of the company gets alerted to that and it starts to check in more regularly to that area. Right. And the analogy in your body is so say you you land awkwardly, you hurt your back, you sprain it, you sprain something or there's some tissue sensitivity from high amounts of back bending that area of your lower back, because it's starting to have some some uh, signals of something going wrong or some signals of danger your brain will check in more regularly on your lower back. It wants more information. So it might actually increase the amount of information coming from those nerves or coming from that area of your back, which makes you more acutely aware of my back hurts with this or my back hurts with that. So you're thinking about it more, but it's also the sensitivity of those areas can cause the back to become more irritable or cranky. And so you're constantly more you know, aware of things that bug your back. That might be why you have more sensitivity. That might be why you have more pain. So in, in that analogy, what we have to do is we have to do the same exact things of education, workloads, exercise progressions to calm down that area to kind of get that to feel better to reduce the sensitivity. And then your brain will kind of calm down and won't be as concerned about what's going on. Right. So that's another really good analogy too that I like. I want to stop and, and mention how in this situation, you could use the exact same conversation of mechanical based, very pathological based irritation symptoms and, and overlapping of why problems might happen, right? There are times when somebody is very interested in the, the anatomy, the biomechanics and how I connect with them, how I build trust, how I build rapport and get them to buy in is by teaching them the anatomy, not to terrify them, but just to kind of use these same models. These are literally from the clinic I use, but I can make that same example say, you know what? You know, we've been backbending a lot and you've been doing a lot of skills that backbends. These joints are a little irritable. They get a little inflammation because you've been overdoing it just a little bit. Or maybe we have not found the, the best technique in strength conditioning. What happens is that that irritation of this joint 
and maybe some of the muscles around here, right? That causes some crankiness. And what happens is because that area is really, really irritable, you know, it's, it's highly sensitive to these movements. So backbending doesn't feel awesome and we don't want to do that. In order for us to make sure that we calm your back down and get you back to the things you want to do and that you love, we have to take some pressure off these joints and take some pressure off these nerve areas to make sure it's not too problematic, right? And that can be a very pathological, mechanical, you know, uh, explanation for someone who has problems. It happens a lot in forward-based forward -based issues too. That whole analogy of, you know, you're, you've over, overdone a little bit of rounding. Rounding is good. is not bad for your back. It's okay to bend over, but you've just done a little bit too much, right? The average person flexes their spine 3000 plus day, times per day, and maybe doesn't have enough back bending. We've just maybe overdone the, the forward based motion. It's caused some, some t tissue sensitivity from a pain science point of view. And we have some, uh, high, high levels of sensitivity and your brain's trying to protect you. So it's giving you this pain output. And what we need to do is try to just get that CEO and get that alarm to calm back down. We'll do that with some, some education, some exercises and just, and just modifying the way that you're doing your daily life and getting you back to gymnastics and you'll be okay. Right. That's a pain science explanation for some of that kind of stuff with those analogies. Somebody also, I could say, you know what, you know, we've, we've rounded a little bit too much and done some heavy forces moving forward. We might have caused this little bit of a disc to move backwards and cause some irritation to the nerves and the muscles of your lower back. That's why you're feeling some symptoms down your leg. And right now what's happening is there's a little bit of a lo local irritation or inflammation of these areas. You have these nerves peripherally sensitized that want to kind of cause that, uh, that area to become more aware of what's going on. We've irritated these nerves with some, uh, you know, peripheral sensitization. We have a high nociceptive drive. And because of that, we're having a pain, you know, signal that's coming from that area. The way we're going to fix that is we're going to try to reduce the pressure from flexing. We're going to get you back in a more neutral position for a little while. And then we'll work on extension. When you feel better, we'll work on some core work. We'll get you back with some flexion based exercises when the time is right, but you know, you're going to be okay. No worries at all. Very mechanical based explanation for that kind of stuff. And I think 80% of the pain science and mechanical world overlap. People just um, some, sometimes unfortunately live in the camp world and they want to do one thing, but I've learned every system that I can possibly think about. Mackenzie, SFMI, Paul Hodges, Shirley Salmon, PRI, um, Paul Hodges work, Peter O'Sullivan's work, all of it, 80% of it is overlapping into being a nice human who listens to the person and tries to understand what they're going through and using a realistic exercise based program with some other things built in their manual therapy, uh, breathing drills, dry needling, some stuff to get them to reduce their amount of acute pain so they can exercise better. Everything I do, manual therapy, maybe some needling, uh, education, all that kind of stuff, tool work, all the fancy stuff that people might use a lot. I use that as a way to get someone's sensitivity level down so they can exercise more comfortably and get back to the things they love. That's like the hallmark of my low back tre treatments. That and workloads and strength conditioning make up the majority of what I do. Okay. So a lot of the other stuff that I talk about is involved there, but I want to get somebody back to what they want to do. And sometimes that is just trying to find a way to calm down their symptoms, whether it's exercise or hands-on work. I'm trying to listen to what the patient wants and try to listen to what they think it's going to make them better and try to match my expertise with their beliefs and try to get that going. Okay. So what do we do in the very, very beginning part of um, a injury, right? The acute phase, right? Some people will need bracing or extended rest. There is controversy, like I said, around whether bracing is great, whether it's not. Where I'm from Boston, bracing tends to be the issue with extension. We use bracing to calm down someone's symptoms. Sometimes it's a soft brace for four to six weeks. Sometimes it's a hard brace for three months if they have a fracture. Um, but for some way, shape, or form, the biggest thing in acute phase is to stabilize the injury. What I mean by that is one, rule out red flags. Uh, foot drop, bowel and bladder symptoms, uh, weight loss, uh, you know, all the scary stuff, rule that out first, dermatomes, myotomes, all that kind of things, reflexes, I would do all that, obviously. But if someone doesn't have red flags, that I'm sending to a physician for the next thing I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out what are we going to do from an education and workload modification point of view based on the criteria you met for what causes your pain? What are we going to do for the opposite side? Okay, so what are we gonna do for the opposite motion or neutral to get you out of that position that doesn't feel awesome, okay? And it's hard with lower back issues why, why the timelines are longer because you can't not use your back. If I have an ankle injury, I can probably put it in a brace. I can probably just not use it. I can go on crutches, right? You can't really do that with your lower back. So sometimes it's really challenging to give someone what they need to feel better, which is why education on the anatomy or pain science or symptoms or whatever you want to use, right? Whatever meets the person in front of you, meets the person in front of you. It's why it's so important to have this educational background on anatomy and biomechanics and ruling them in so we can give them something to start with to, to modify their workloads. For most people I treat with back pain, I've seen some people with really, really aggressive sciatica or really acute painful stress fractures. Most people just want to 
be helped with education and how to how to just modify their things. They need basic education, basic uh, exercise, and basic workload modification to get them out of this really really hot phase. I personally, and I'm not going to go down the literature rabbit hole. Why I don't believe or follow that they have pelvis upslips and downslips and flares and leg length discrepancies. Like, yes, there is a time and a place for that kind of stuff, but I don't think, and I, I learned all of that stuff for two and a half years. And then I just found the reliability of research for palpation wasn't great. I didn't find a lot of great outcome success in, you know, popping somebody with the muscle energy technique and having them do it. I didn't find great long-term outcome strategies for me. And I didn't find great research to support that. I started to go more into the education, workload modification, strength and conditioning. And I found very, very good outcomes with that along with like treatment for like McKenzie and some other stuff like that. So that's personally what I use the most, but educating somebody is so, so important. Why does my back hurt? What's going on? And I explain either pain science or mechanical. Here's what I think is going on. We did these special tests. These motions don't feel awesome. When you back bend, we might put pressure on these joints. It doesn't feel awesome. It's sensitive right now. So what we need to do is get you out of that position and bend forward a little bit or go to neutral. Okay. So I'm always educating somebody on what skills or things probably created their problems, what I think is going on with their back, what category of, of, of intolerance they fit, and what we're going to do to make them feel better. And with that being said, I'm educating them on their daily life. I don't believe that what we do in the clinic for an hour is going to outdo 24, 23 other hours of their daily life. So if someone is in arch based pain, I'm saying, let's be careful about laying on our stomach. Let's be careful about doing stuff on our elbows while we're like texting or something like that. Let's try to not be upright for too long. Let's switch our posture, right? There's no bad posture. We just want to constantly have a variable posture. Like sitting's not bad for you. Arching's not bad for you. It's just a dosage thing, right? It's, it's about making sure we're doing a lot of different variety of movements to shift the stresses around our back. So I'll educate somebody with back pain that's going backwards about let's not lay in our stomach for maybe a couple of weeks. Let's try to be careful about back bending. Let's try to be careful about how long we go for long walks. Someone in the opposite direction who's flexion and tall, and I'll say that. Let's be, let's be careful on sitting on a really low couch. Let's be careful on sitting in a really low car. Let's try to sit with a towel roll support in our lower back on something elevated just to kind of take you out of that really round, sensitive position for now. Let's be careful on not touching our toes or stretching our back just for a couple of days or a week to make sure we're sensitive or pulling down that sensitivity, that alarm system like I talked about. I'll educate somebody on the basics of why they're in pain, what things we think are going on, and how to modify their daily activity to try to, try to reduce that symptoms. Now, with that being being said, I will also give them some workload modification of not doing certain skills or not doing certain movements along with directional preference exercises to help them on the other side. So if your back feels awful with back bending, what's probably going to make you feel better is going from a cat camel position of neutral to rounding and just working on moving a little bit under anti-gravity positions, right? To make your back move a little bit, just to sensitivity level. We might do some rock backs with deep exhale breathing. I might do some round uh, belt, uh, curled up breathing to try to exhale and get a posterior pelvic tilt to get them out of that extension. But the opposite is true for someone who has flexion intolerant. I might put someone on their stomach prone on elbows in a McKenzie progression to just say, just hang out here for 30 seconds, just take some deep breaths then lay on your stomach then push back up. I might go from neutral to arch in their cat camel, right? I might, if they're tolerable for it, do some press ups, right? Or do some, uh, some nice, easy back bends and standing. I'm really big on consistency over intensity for baseline levels of intervention, right? Day one, an eval might just look like, Hey, let's go through the thing. Make sure you look good. Let's do a little bit of, um, you know, cat camel work in the position that feels good. Let's do some press ups. If you're flexion intolerant or some rock back breathing, I might just do very basic, uh, you know, education on the, the motion to avoid and the motion to kind of promote more. And I might say for the first couple of times and uh, first couple of days, so I see it maybe in a week or two, let's just do, um, 10 to 20 of these basic exercises, breathing cat camels, whatever makes you feel better every few hours for a couple of days you know, for the next week until I see you again. And nine times out of 10 education, making them feel comfortable listening to their story and doing basic education and exercise, they start to feel symptom relief quite a bit. So it gets them out of that like, really hot phase. I'm not manipulating someone. Some people need that. And like, that's like, the time and place for that. I'm not trying to knock chiros or even PTs. I just don't tend to do that a lot in the first couple of days. I just want to get a baseline education, a baseline help and give them a few exercises that show me in the clinic, their symptoms feel better and have them do them consistently over the course of the day. Now, that being said, I do want to try to get somebody into some sort of activity as fast as I can. If they have flexion intolerance, I want to say, go for walks, try to be active. Don't just lay around and do nothing. Try to stay upright and moving, right? Don't do nothing because bed rest is not going to be super helpful, but I want to get someone going. So if, if the time and the place is right, they're not super acute. I will give them baseline 
just very, very easy core exercises to start with because I want to keep them active, right? So we might do a neutral dead bug, a bird dog, a side plank with bent knees, um, a plank, a bent knee plank hold, an anti-rotation press out, just neutral based core stuff. I don't think I'm strengthening their core. I don't think I'm going crazy with that. I'm not getting them stronger. I'm just keeping them active. I'm, I'm keeping them to be excited about, okay, there's hope here. I'm going to get better, right? And you can make the, the pain science neuro tag argument that the belief system is causing this to be better too. But I just believe in keeping someone working, right? There's tons of work from Stuart McGill, Paul Hodges that you can go down the rabbit hole and look at like, you know, when someone has acute pain, how the muscle fiber differentiation changes in activation from within fibers or interarticular muscles or, you know, activation, that stuff is just equally as relevant. I like that as a background knowledge. I don't talk to people about that because I think it's kind of too geeky, but I'm just trying to find ways to keep them active and keep them moving. Right. So we might do bird dog, dead bug, bent knee, side plank, anti-rotation, press out, plank drag through once a day, along with their exercises for the first couple of weeks, just to get them moving along with educating them about what to avoid temporarily and what's sensitive and what to be careful about. Now I will say, there are some times when I think that manual therapy is very, very helpful. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of yes versus no. I think it's nonspecific. I think it's general input. I don't think it's fixing fascia. I don't think it's doing that. But I do sometimes use heat and soft tissue because someone's in so much acute pain that just doing some hands-on work will calm them down. Maybe it's laying on the table for five minutes and getting a heat pack and me rubbing them that causes parasympathetic drive and causes them to have less acute nociceptive drive. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's placebo. I have no idea. But some people do feel really good with light soft tissue work to the paraspinals, proximal glutes, QLs. And I have found that it allows them to tolerate their exercise progression much more comfortably. So we might do some cupping, we might do some dry needling, we might do some manual therapy, we might do some very easy soft tissue stuff for five minutes, 10 minutes, just to get them out of that acute guarded phase so that they can do their exercises more comfortably. The faster I can get away from manual therapy, the better, but there are some people that really, really do well. And I think again, the pain science swing to mechanical overlap, you can't live dogmatic like that. You can't swear by one system. They're all great. But you also can't say that no one should ever get manual therapy ever, right? Or you shouldn't say no one should ever, you know, do or everyone should get manual therapy all the time because they need me. I think those things are really problematic. For some people, I skip manual therapy altogether. I want them to exercise, get moving. We never do manual therapy at all. For other people, it helps them. They feel better. They're paying me for a service. I'm trying to educate them. We'll do it for a couple of sessions, maybe here and there as a as a maintenance type thing. And we get them into exercise as fast as they can. The faster I can get someone to a strength and conditioning program, the better. If manual therapy helps me on that process, I'm good, right? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do some core strength. Also in this acute phase, I'm trying to evaluate their shoulder flexibility, their thoracic spine flexibility, and their hip flexibility and work on that during this phase. So maybe they have 10 degrees, 20 degrees of limited over flexibility. I'm going to give them thoracic spine work and shoulder soft tissue work to clear up some of those things as they get back to it. Maybe they have really bad compression-based back pain, but their ankles are super, super tight from old ankle sprains, we'll work on their ankle sprain, uh, or so we'll work on their ankle mobility in that process to try to get them better, right? So maybe we'll work on those things along with their local stuff, along with their core stuff in these first couple uh, weeks that we have somebody, right? I'm teaching a lot of people about core control too, about I'll put their knees up, to 90, put their heels up on a chair. Let's talk about bracing and breathing. Let's talk about what arch versus hollow versus neutral is. Let's talk about breathing on top of a nice core brace poke their obliques and say, brace this, like you're going to cough a little bit for me. Now take some deep diaphragmatic breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth, post your lateral rib expansion, try to get nice and easy outward expansion of the ribs, trying to just start that early education of what bracing and breathing will look like so that when later down the road, we do compression work or sprinting work or high impact work, they feel understanding around, okay, what is bracing? What is breathing? What is using that active subsystem to try to protect my back a little bit? Okay. So from there, we'll try to do as much arm and leg maintenance as possible right? We really love doing BFR here. I do BFR single leg work for a lot of people with low back pain because it's low load, but high intensity. So we'll do some BFR split squats, step ups, very, very easy type work like that. Um, I, I find it's really, really useful to do here. And that's the majority of what I'm doing in the acute phase, education, workload modification, taking away the things that bug them or the motions that bug them, trying to make sure we add some exercises that are the opposite motion to take away some of their symptoms or make them feel better, staying as active as possible, maybe some manual therapy, cupping, dry needling if it's appropriate for the patient, and then trying to make sure we find any way to keep them moving and active and excited as possible for the mental health side, but also the you know loading side with BFR, with a, a non, you know, as back aggressive uh, strength program, a lot of single leg work, stuff like that. That's the majority of what I'm doing along with working on impairments above or below. So flexibility or strength issues above or below. I'm doing all that in the first four to six weeks. And people do really well. I think, I think people do really, really well, again, with education, 
showing you care and having a consistency over intensity mindset. Don't go bananas on 4,000 exercises. Just take four to five that really work for them. Let's consistently do those to feel better. All right. In the intermediate phase of rehabilitation, a lot of what I'm doing is really focusing on exercise. That middle portion is really for me about just getting them active again, getting them to get kind of more involved and trying to make them feel better. So one thing we do is we progress all the core work, right? So we progress all the core work to more advanced versions of the things that we just talked about. So I'm trying to get into a program, anti-flexion, anti-extension, anti-side bending, anti-rotating, and then anti-compression along with maybe some extra stuff here and there. So I might progress be able to do bear crawling, straight knee side planks instead of a bent knee side plank, maybe lifting the top leg. Plank drag throughs are really, really great. Wall press dead bugs, sled pushes, sled pulls, suitcase carries, farmer's carries. Um, if it's appropriate, we'll start doing some lower body loading, which I'll talk about next, but really advancing all the core stuff. Stability, stir the, stability ball, stir the pot, trunk stability, uh, curl ups from Stu McGill whatever I can possibly do to build a nice core program around that, right? Combined with a lot of lower body, upper body work. So I'm trying to get somebody back to the main movement patterns of upper body and lower body. So for lower body, squatting, hinging, split squat, or sorry, split pelvis, and then single leg. So I'm trying to do usually uh, glute bridges, single leg glute bridges first with weight. That's usually more comfortable. Eventually getting to a kettlebell deadlift for anti-flexion training, which is great too for hinging. Um, squatting, goblet squatting is usually good to a box. Um, I usually start splits pelvis and step up stuff more aggressively in the other two patterns because they are a little bit more back loading. I, I take those off a little bit more, but split squats, um, rear foot elevated split squats, front foot forward, it's uh, front foot elevated split squats. If someone has um, extension based back pain, I probably will go with a front foot elevated split squat first to tilt them forward so they're not arching their back. If someone has uh, flexion based uh, back pain, I'll probably go with a rear foot elevated split squat first to get them more in an upright posture. But lots of split squats, lop ups, lots of step ups, lots of step downs. I love doing sleds, sled pushes, sled pulls, lateral drags. I love doing loaded carries, suitcase carries, farmer carries, all that kind of stuff is phenomenal. And then for the upper body, it, it, whatever they can tolerate, right? Horizontal pushing and pulling, overhead pushing and pulling, and then accessory work. I'm trying to build a holistic strength and conditioning program around these things. So it might be um, uh, one, a might be a four by eight split squat. One B might be, um, push ups, four by eight push ups. One C might be a, uh, suitcase carry March. Uh, and then for two, a, we might have some sort of a, a squat. So a goblet squat, for example, uh, two B might be the rowing. So feet elevated rows or face pulls. One C might be, um, stability ball, stir the pot or uh, an anti-rotation press through. I'll get all the categories into a two day program. I'll probably see them once and I'll help them with whatever they need me for to teach them exercises, update things, make sure they're feeling good. And I'll write a two to three day home program and have them go nuts on that. But it's all about strength and conditioning here, right? Trying to get the baseline leg patterns, advance the core work, make sure they're feeling better with their pain and trying to slowly get them back to what they want to do. That honestly takes up a good four week progression of, of integrating all these things together and getting them to feel comfortable. All right. And then the advanced phase here for me is really all about doing more ballistic work, more plyometric work, more explosive work. So it's a combination of power work and then also plyometrics, jumping and running, and then trying to get them back into unloaded movements, right? So during the intermediate phase, I, I do believe in restoring um, full range of motion in their back. So whether it's cat camels or rock backs, they should be able to touch their toes, bend back, turn, all that kind of stuff without uh, load on them. I do believe you should move your body back and forth, front to back, all that kind of stuff. So I'm restoring anti-gravity motion of their spine. Uh, again, rounding, deep squatting, cat camels. That's how I do it. Press ups, all that kind of stuff. I would slowly restore that kind of stuff so that in this next phase of advanced rehab, they're not afraid to flex their spine a little bit under brace conditions. They're not afraid to arch their back. They feel good with that. So usually by the intermediate phase, I want someone to be negative on their clearing tests so they can touch their toes. All the stuff I just talked about, they can touch their toes. They can bend back. They can do a stork test. They can do a press up test. They can do a prone on elbows test. Seated compression is negative. Heel drop is negative. I want all these things to be negative before we go hardcore into the strength conditioning part. But now that someone's here, and they feel better, usually around like two to three months out for most people. Um, I want them to do uh, aggressive work. Med ball slams are phenomenal for anti-flexion training. Med ball seated overhead throws backwards are really good. And then you can start to stand up. Uh, rotational med ball work is really good too. But I want them to slam med balls, throw med balls. I want them to start doing some uh, jumping work like uh, box jumps, depth jumps, broad jumps, uh, single leg skipping, right? We're doing um, some sort of plyometric work in there as well. So low hurdle hops, medium hurdle hops, sprinting front to back, sprinting side to side, jump and land and stick with that proper education about how to land properly. I love doing seated box jumps. I love doing seated dumbbell jumps with boxes as well. Um, band resisted broad jumps are really good as well. 
all of these things I'm trying to do to reintroduce some of these forces, right? So reintroduce um, rounding of the, not rounding of the back, but flexion based moments with uh, med ball slams and uh, deadlifting and hip lifting, uh, med ball throws overhead reverse to try to expose their body to triple extension, st- triple extension using their hips, their lower back and their shoulders together. Um, a lot of these things are going to be happening with med ball slams and med ball throws and jumping and sprinting and plyos. That's the majority of what I do. We'll keep pushing the strength, but I'm putting more of it into jumping, landing, sprinting, that progression of exercise. So I'll just add maybe one to two power things to the top of their program. So seated, maybe we'll do a med ball slam combined with a seated dumbbell jump, right? Three sets of five of each of those on the 1A, 1B. The 2A, 2B, we might do a broad jump connected with some sort of reverse med ball overhead throw so that we get a good balance of slamming forces, throwing forces, jumping forces horizontally, and jumping forces vertically together. We would do that along with some hurdle work, jumping over bounding, sprinting front to back, all that kind of stuff will slowly get introduced here. I'll probably do this for about you know four to six weeks. I also, during this time, will start slowly reintroducing gymnastic-specific strength. So uh, tuck-ups, leg lifts, L-holds, Tall kneeling backbends are a phenomenal drill to get them to learn how to backbend properly. So kneeling with their arms overhead, reach back, tap a wall, use your shoulders and your hips more than your lower back and exposes that arch stress, that extreme range of motion stress. Um, we're also doing some active flexibility here. So I start to get them back into split sliders. I start to get them into kicks and jumps and leaps, uh, rope climbs. A lot of the basic conditioning stuff can start to be slowly added back into here to test the waters a little bit. I will say, you have to go based on what their main symptoms were. If someone is flexion intolerant, I will probably add in leg lifts a little bit later in this phase or L holds or compression work in this phase, right? Or tuck throughs in this phase. If someone is extension intolerant, I'll probably add in back bends and med ball throws arching backwards or arch rocks and stuff like that or arch holds later in the rehab process. If someone is compression intolerant, I will be adding in depth jumps and box jumps and pogo hops and broad jumps a little bit later in the phase. So just keep in mind that you want to push those things a little bit out a couple of weeks when you first start this, because you don't want to go too crazy uh, right away. Okay. And then next moving on from here, right? We have the advanced rehab side of things. So we have all those going through and then we're kind of getting them back. What is the return to sports progression? Okay. So return to sports progression is largely based on, again, what their category was. However, we want to make sure that someone is going slowly through six to eight weeks of rehab here. Okay. So the first thing I do is I make up, I take all their skills and I put them into a, a category of what things were the least provocative, most provocative. I outline over the cross those. And then every two weeks, we're going to progress things. Okay. So I start with the things we modify or the things we work with are the surface, the force per skill, and the number of the skill. So the first week, we're going to go on softer surfaces with very low repetition counts, and we're going to go on very, very low impact and low numbers. So we might just do basic jumping on tumble track, basic jumping on trampoline, jumps, leaps, turns, excuse me, um, basic bar work because usually that's, comp- that's better on drills and stuff like that. So for two weeks, we're going to go softer surfaces, basic skills with low numbers. Okay. After that feels good. We'll go three times a week for that, making sure there's no symptoms in between, making sure they feel okay, keeping their rehab up, doing their home programs in between that. Okay. And then from there, we'll move up the next two weeks to harder surfaces, medium. So rod strip, maybe landing on a resi pit, landing on a semi-firm mat. We'll do slightly harder skills. It was just basics in the beginning. And now we're maybe doing some connected tumbling on rod strip. Maybe we're doing some jumps and leaps on beam, not doing, you know, back bending if that hurt yet right away, but maybe doing some uh, dismount timers, maybe doing some drills on vault, maybe just jumping on the trampoline, doing some rod tum- tumbling and tracks, stuff like that together for rod strip. Um, and we'll start slowly introducing that for two weeks, right? Then we'll go to medium or hard surfaces with harder skills and moderate skill volume. So we'll keep the surfaces the same, but we'll do full tumbling. We'll do full jumping and landing. We'll do full in bars. We'll do full releases, right? And we'll do more of them per week, okay? Then the last two weeks, we'll expose someone to harder surfaces, hard skills with an open-ended cap kind of say, no more than seven of one skill per day but slowly get yourself back to full training, right? And I have found in many, many people that that's really, really good and it's really, really helpful. Again, just keep in mind that somebody has to be only progressing based on what their category was. If they were very extension intolerant, you don't want to add those things in until like the fourth or fifth week with tumble track or softer surfaces or spotting or drills, okay? If someone is flexion intolerant, you don't want to add in in bars and stalders and double backs or rounding and kips till the third or fourth week to make sure they're okay. If they're compression intolerant, you want to be very careful on the surface progression and you don't want to go super heavy with dismounts and landings until the third or fourth week, okay? So just keep that in mind that that last, that category that bugs them the most, you want to push towards the end of their return to sport program. And I use those for six to eight weeks. That's the whole rehab process from acute all the way to return to sport. And then maintenance care wise, 
Workloads are really important. Make sure we're spreading out those things across the week, right? If someone has a lot of extension, we don't want to do them all on the same day. We want to also talk about educating the person on not only how to backbend properly or how to land properly, but not doing too much of that in one session. So don't just, like I said, no, just 10 beam routines, 10 vaults, go for it. We'll see how you feel. That's not going to go well, right? Really being conscious of that cap, really being conscious of the thing that bugged them, talking to coaches, talking to medical providers, talking to parents all together, communicating about symptoms, all that kind of stuff, really, really important. Okay. Most important thing for maintenance and prevention is going to be a really good strength conditioning program to be educating that person on proper weightlifting, proper strength training, proper conditioning for their body, doing all the gymnastic specific stuff, but then also doing all of the weightlifting stuff as well. Have to have a really, really good strength and conditioning program. Have to have a really, really good flexibility program. So make sure we're doing science-based flexibility stuff for their shoulders, their upper back, and their lower back. Let's also make sure that someone is really doing a good job of correcting their technique, landing properly, going slow, relearning things that are bugging them or that were problematic in the beginning. The combination of workloads, proper strength and conditioning, proper flexibility, and good technique is the absolute foundation for how we reduce the risk of injuries in lower back, right? Reduce overall injuries in whole, but also for lower backs. So those are the biggest, biggest things I, I stress for, pre, for maintenance and prevention. Keep up your strength program, keep up your flexibility program, keep up some of that baseline PT grunt work, right? And be patient, be patient, right? Which kind of goes now into the troubleshooting of challenging cases. And the cases that I work with that are the challenging ones that people aren't getting better, they are going too fast. They're trying to get back to all their hard surfaces right away. They got a meet coming up. They want to kind of skip steps and jump right into it. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of meet season. It doesn't matter if it's like the biggest, you know, championship for this year. You have to be patient and let your back slowly get exposed to forces over time. I can't tell you how many times I see it. Someone skips steps. They, they don't go through the proper rehab process. They don't want to go through the strength conditioning stuff. They jump back into it. They get way too hot too soon and they, they flare their back up and then they are out for another month. So go slow, respect the healing timelines. I know it's frustrating. I know it sucks, but it has to happen. Okay. The other big thing that I see is really problematic in some of these issues with people who don't get better is cultural problems. Okay. So do you have aligned goals? Do your goals of the gymnast match the parent, match the coach, match everybody's ideas together of what you want out of the sport? If you've changed your goals and you don't want to go high level and you don't want to move up in levels or you don't want to go that you want to just do something else, a different sport, a different level, whatever, that's okay. That's totally fine. But if nobody knows that, how do we all help you, right? So you have to speak up about your goals, have a hard conversation about are our goals the same as they were two years ago or three years ago, okay? The other thing that's common here is you have to have a culture that is accepting and open to injuries and dealing with them head on, right? Like I said, if someone's scared to speak up about their back hurting because someone's gonna brush them off and say like, oh, whatever, just keep going, or like, you're not tough enough, or even worse, it's like nonverbal psychological warfare where the coach just ignores them and it's like, mm, okay, you know, like that kind of like snooty shade throwing, um, that's, that's never gonna get better. Someone's gonna always have problems, they're always gonna be terrified to speak up about their back. So you have to be in a place where it's open, communicated, really honest, radical candor is used to talk about these issues head on, and it's not like someone's gonna be miserable all the time when they try to talk about it, right? Some of these things take up to a year to get better, right? Some famous stories of really high-level gymnasts who had stress fractures or had nerve issues. They had to take a year or two off of competing and just do rehab and get stronger and slowly get back. They returned to the highest level, no problem at all, okay? So lots of communication, lots of trust, right? Lots of discussion of pain. If there's fear or mental blocks going on about certain skills, we have to maybe talk about how we work through those with a mental health provider or what technique has to change or how do we make sure the level is appropriate for your goals to slowly get back to those skills, like for backbending, for example, or for, for certain skills, if you're nervous and you land short and it hurts your back, you have to deal with those head on as well. Okay. And that being said, quickly on that is that you also have to make sure that you have a place that is going to have a nice holistic program and that works technique and that works basics and that works foundational technique and isn't just blowing through and chucking skills, right? Nothing is going to make you get worse faster than rushing back and just throwing all your skills and not rebuilding the basics really, really well. Okay. And then lastly, along with patients, stuff like that, does that gym, does that culture, does that gymnast respect learning proper technique and being disciplined for that kind of stuff. Do they really have technique issues that have to get dealt with? The, the gymnast definitely needs to take accountability and kind of deal with some of those technique issues head on and not just, you know, start throwing their back in just crazy positions again, or, or not really working on the, the strength and conditioning, the, the basics, all that kind of stuff. They have to have to go to practice and put in the work and conditioning and be effortful for what they're doing. They can't just skip around a little bit, right? I'm a fan of the proper time off and the proper workloads to be resting and stuff like that. But if you only show up to half your practices or you're pushing too fast too soon or you're comparing yourself to other gymnasts or the parents are comparing themselves to other kids, it's just going to be a house of cards that implodes, okay? So that's what I would say for challenging cases is align goals, culture that supports it, 
Um, making sure it's mental health wise is talked about. Lastly, I'll also say that I didn't mention is skill modification. That's a huge one too. Sometimes somebody can't get back to the level they want because the skills they're doing are all too much on one side, right? So in back extension type stuff, it happens a lot. So someone does back handsprings on beam, they do back handsprings tumbling on floor, they do a Yurchenko vault, and they also do like a, an in bar that has arching uh, free hip or shapash, something like that. So Maybe we can modify their beam series. Maybe we can do a round off back full one and a half or a round off double back or a round off layout instead of a round off back handspring layout. And then maybe it's up to you whether you want to change your chankos and go to souks or not. But just changing your beam series and changing your floor tumbling passes might take down a thousand impacts and a thousand arches per month. And that might be what you need to get back. A lot of times that not changing of skill profile keeps somebody having a tough time over and over again. So lots of skills in gymnastics, tougher and compulsories, but lots of things you can work on to feel better. All right. So I wanted to keep this under uh, two hours. I did not do it, but I'm sorry. I wanted to go nice and slow and over deliver. So if you sat through that whole thing, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, if you want more information, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but the money's whatever. I don't care. Um, if you want to take a full course on everything I've learned and watch every exercise, every intervention, all the sheets, all the program templates, we have a full medical course online. Uh, current concepts and evaluation and treatment of lower back pain and gymnasts. It's very popular. It's approved for CEUs, PTs, and ATs for eight and a half or 10, 10 units, I believe. So if you want to learn everything from a medical point of view, you can have it all. If you want to get in our coaching group um, and talk to people about these issues, the Hero Lab and Shift HQ is like my uh, monthly membership webinar that I do. We have like 500 plus people in there, gymnastics professionals from all around the world. It's phenomenal. But the Hero Lab, you can sign up for that. Uh, shiftmovementscience.com backslash the Hero Lab. Um, but thank you. Thank you for listening to this. I know these are gauntlets. These are long ones to get through, but I hope my hope is that by over delivering and talking a lot about these things, they will stand the test of time and be something that people come back to over and over and over again. We have the video here with the models. I wrote a blog post that has everything that you could possibly want out of back pain, all the exercises, all the, all the pathologies, everything you need to know, timelines. I tried to just spend a ridiculous number of hours putting together something that's really valuable for people and that can really help the gymnastics community because I know so many people struggle with back pain. I had back pain myself. It was crippling in my career. So my hope is that this stands the test of time and the research is, is pretty up to date for now up until 2022 when I recorded this. But I hope this was helpful. If you have no financial means to invest in stuff and you do, and you can't support shit, that's totally fine. Save your money, but just share the episode. Share it with your friends, your parents, uh, coaches, because that helps get the awareness out to more people. And hopefully that will kind of trickle down and be more impactful for the community. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the support and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.